Philosophy is about reason and rationality, while literature or storytelling is about emotions and hope. Philosophy tries to answer why questions, why we die. Literature reassures us that it's all okay, the story continues even after we die. But what is psychology? Simply put, it's the child of philosophy mating with literature. Philosophy is its father and literature is its mother. Hi everyone, in this course I'll tell you the story of psychology encompassing an incredible 3000 years of psychological history. By the end of this video, you will know all the basic psychological ideas, schools and approaches as well as some of the most influential psychologists and psychoanalysts from around the world. The video has four major parts and each with two or three sections. In part one, I'll tell you about the origin of psychology from ancient Greece and ancient India to modern science. Where does psychology come from? Two disciplines play a major role in giving birth to psychology. Philosophy is like the father and literature is the mother. Philosophy is the rational side and literature is the emotional side. In this section, I'll also answer what is the purpose of psychology. In part 2, I'll look into how psychology understands the human mind including the consciousness and the unconscious. First, I'll look at the pioneers of psychology including William James, Johann Herbert and Wilhelm Wundt who tried to understand consciousness. Then I'll look into a behaviorist school of psychology that understands the human mind through our behavior. In other words, action speaks louder than words. And finally, I'll look at the two of the most influential figures in psychology, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, who each try to understand the unconscious. In part 3, I'll look at how psychology became a practical tool for diagnosing and treating patients with mental problems. I'll look into two distinct approaches. Psychotherapy, which has a strong German origin focused on the unconscious, and cognitive therapy, which has a more Anglo-Saxon tradition focused on the conscious mind. In part 4, I'll look into other factors in psychology. Outside the human mind in general, factors such as society, age, and sex play a crucial role in our psychology. So in this section, I'll discuss social psychology, child psychology, and sex psychology. At the end, I'll also discuss the paradox of psychology and the paradox of personality. This course gives you an overview of psychology as an academic discipline. By the end, you should have a clear picture of what psychology is and what it studies and who are some of the key figures. So get yourself some coffee and let's begin. By the way, if you want to buy the script of this video in a book format, you can find the link down below. This also supports the channel. So thank you very much. One, why psychology, a brief history. In this segment, I'll tell you about the philosophical origin of psychology, its history, its many different disciplines. So if psychology is a child, the section will tell you about its birth. The term psychology comes from Greek. Psyche means mind or soul and logi meaning the study of. Psychology simply means the study of the mind. Psychology has been with humans since the dawn of time, but it was part of philosophy. Historically speaking, philosophy, at least Greek philosophy, was concerned with three main subjects. The physical world of matter, the origin of life, and the human mind. Today, the physical world of matter is studied in physics and chemistry, while biology deals with life. The human mind has become the domain of psychology, so philosophy encompassed all of them. Now you might ask, why do we humans have philosophy in the first place? The simple answer is, the awareness of death gave rise to philosophical probing to understand what's the meaning of life, and how the world works, and how we know about reality. So you can say that the main reason we have psychology basically goes back to our awareness of death and the human condition. As animals, we evolved to develop consciousness, self-consciousness, which gave us the ability to anticipate our own death long before death itself. It is terrifying to know that we all die. There has to be a reason behind death. 
Thus, we invented religions and stories to give death a meaning and console ourselves with the afterlife as another will. So afterlife is nothing but a convenient answer to the terrifying ordeal of death. So the invention of gods and demons were in a way to numb that existentialist crisis. Believing that there is a heaven, a perfect utopia waiting for us gives us a bit of comfort. Now let's talk about early psychological questions within philosophy. The early psychologists were partly philosophers and partly physicians who were tackling the same questions we face today. How come individuals have different personalities and tendencies or behaviors? When you open a new computer or smartphone, you do not expect it to be different from other computers or smartphones of the same model. But humans come in many external forms such as height and shape, but also internal forms such as personality and mood. The first pioneers of psychology were the ancient Greeks and Romans. The first true school of psychology is called humorism. It's not a comedy club, but a psychological analysis of human personality types. Humorism the Greek physician Hippocrates, who lived between 460 and 370 BC, has given us the Hippocratic Oath in Medicine, in which doctors promise to do no harms to anyone. Hippocrates thought the body contained fluids or humor that healed itself. In other words, the human body had properties such as earth, air, fire, and water that made it capable of healing itself. He allowed his patients to rest to allow the body's healing mechanism to kick in. Today we might call it easing one's body during sickness which allows the patients to get better by themselves. Or it could be simply the immune system that fights viruses and illnesses. Of course, Hippocrates also prescribed drugs but his approach was a baby step in psychological treatment of easing one from their burdens and letting them rest. A few centuries later, the Roman physicians Claudius Galen, who lived between 129 and 201 AD, developed the humorist approach further by arguing that humans have four distinct personalities, depending on the level of humor such as earth, water, air, and fire in their body. In other words, if you had one element more, your personality shifted in that direction more. So the human body for him was like a cooked meal with many ingredients and each with different volumes and proportions could determine your personality type. His personality types were sanguine, the cheerful type, phlegmatic, the quiet type, choleric, the passionate type, and finally melancholic, the artistic type. These personalities are caused by the imbalance in humor and often from birth. But he argued that one can encounter or limit the excess of these temperaments by eating certain food or through physical exercise. Today we use energy drinks, alcohol, drugs and so forth to become more cheerful, energetic and so forth. Too much energy? Exercise to tire yourself. Most people who go to gym would tell you that exercising has a direct impact on their mood. If you feel depressed, do a good workout and you might feel much better. So Galen knew this 2000 years ago. So he thought human personality was like a cooked meal. The taste depended heavily on the amount of each ingredient. Socrates, the father of Western philosophy, shifted the focus from body to the mind. For him, the happy person was the one who discovered his true self. He developed his questioning method through which one asks a series of questions in order to get to the bottom of a problem. This approach is in how modern science analyzes something to understand its property. So Socrates used a series of questions to determine what true self was. He employed reason to understand what's going on. So he concluded that virtue was the ultimate goal of a person and being good meant the person had discovered his true self, which should make you happy. A virtuous man is not only a good man but also a happy man. The reason I use masculine pronouns here is that back then these philosophers are mainly talking about men. Aristotle, the Greek philosopher who came after Socrates, lived between 384 and 322 BC, came up with four ways that we can be happy. 
through sensual pleasures, i.e. sex, material possession, ethical superiority, and logical understanding. Today we all try to maximize these pleasures, so nothing has really changed since the ancient times. Hindu Psychology In ancient India, two collections of texts were extremely important. The Vedas are a collection of texts that concern sociological issues such as religion and politics, but there was another group of texts that mainly focused on the individual's inner journey. These texts are called the Upanishads. In other words, the Vedas had an external or worldly outlook, while the Upanishads had a more internal and personal outlook. Generally speaking, the Vedas have a more social message, while the Upanishads have a more individual message. The Upanishads, written about 2,700 years ago, contain many religious and philosophical ideas and doctrines, but it also contains some deeply psychological insights into the human mind. One of the central themes of the Upanishads is the relation between the self, which is nothing but illusion, and the greater self, which is the real self or spirit or consciousness. Arthur Schopenhauer's psychological philosophy was deeply influenced by the Upanishad, so he argued that within us this will to life force motivates us to do things almost subconsciously. For example, our urge for sex, for instance, is part of this blind will within us. According to Upanishad, Jiva is the visible self and Atman is the hidden true self. Our life's purpose is to fully understand and realize Atman in order to reach Moksha and escape from the cycle of reincarnation. In other words, a kind of self-actualization process to achieve inner bliss. Not through faith, but through active level of consciousness. In other words, knowing deeper layers of human mind can help us escape our human condition. The Upanishads divide consciousness into three stages awake, asleep, and higher consciousness. Most of us experience the first two states. During the waking hours, we are conscious of what's going on around us. During sleep, we lose that ability as our consciousness shut down temporarily. But the third state of consciousness, or Turiya, is only attained through rigorous contemplation and meditation and most importantly, through high level of awareness in which we are actually conscious of the inner self or Atman. In some Upanishad texts, consciousness is divided into four states in which sleep is in turn divided into two, light sleep and deep sleep. And the primary force of life is consciousness. In today's world, meditation, or more specifically yoga, a very old Indian tradition, is used to treat people with psychological problems. Another important element of Upanishads is the relationship between the mind and nature. In Hindu philosophies, humans are not only from nature, but we are nature. There is no separation between humans and other animals. This closeness to nature brings a level of humility. We're not special. So according to Upanishads, our life's goal is to attain enough knowledge and consciousness through rigorous meditation and self-actualization so we realize Atman, the eternal, timeless state of bliss. Islamic World The next development in philosophical psychology took place in the Islamic world where philosophers and physicians combined Greek philosophy and medicine with Indian philosophy and medicine to give it a new flavor as we know today as Islamic Golden Age. These Muslim philosophers were very keen on the understanding of consciousness between the individual consciousness and the universal consciousness. Islam as a religion has a deeply universalistic outlook, so these philosophers were very keen to find ways to explain the human psyche from a universalistic perspective. Most of these philosophers were reacting to Aristotle's natural philosophy and tried to reconcile the scientific method with Islamic universal soul. In other words, the animalistic with the divine perfection, so to speak. In Indian philosophy, it's like the ladder that reaches nirvana. Farabi, who lived between 870 and 950, believed that there are two levels of consciousness. The individual, which is internal, like knowing what we know, which is similar to self-consciousness. 
and active consciousness which allows us to be receptive to external stimuli which allows us to expand on our internal consciousness. This is somewhat similar to Immanuel Kant's rational philosophy that we not only have innate knowledge but we also have our mental structure that allows us to categorize external knowledge. So Farabi divided intellectual consciousness into two, the individual which is subjective and the active which is universal and objective, which seeks and receives external knowledge, somewhat similar to Carl Jung's active imagination. In other words, unlike other animals, we have the rational ability to discriminate, to make moral choices. He also attributed our choices based on our internal organs like heart, brain and liver and the level of heat they contain determine our level of aggression. For example, men are more aggressive because our heart contains more heat compared to women who are more compassionate. Ibn Sina or Avicenna as he is commonly known in the West who lived between 980 and 1037 was a multi-talented man. He was a philosopher, a doctor, a psychologist and a theologian. His famous thought experiment of floating man predates Rene Descartes' I think therefore I am a mind-body dualism by almost 600 years. In floating man, Avicenna imagines a man free-falling or suspended in air with his limbs and body not touching any object. Would he know he exists? In other words, if he had no senses like touch, smell, hearing, sight, taste, would we know we exist? His answer was that Yes, he would still know our existence without the help of our body. His conclusion was that the mind is separate from the body. Ibn Rushd or Averroes, as he is commonly known in the West, lived between 1126 and 1198. He too tried to reconcile the body with the soul. His approach is somewhat similar to Plato in that form gives rise to matter, not the other way around which is contrary to modern science that matter is primary and consciousness is secondary. His argument was that the active consciousness or active intellect becomes individual consciousness within a particular human body. In other words, the soul is universal but becomes individual within each human being. So the spiritual consciousness becomes the material consciousness when it occupies a human body or a container, so to speak. However, once this material consciousness acquired enough knowledge of the world, it has the chance to become greater than the body and rise up to become a universal consciousness that can become immortal, somewhat similar to the Buddhist Nirvana. For example, if knowledge is perfected through our senses, it ultimately becomes a universal sense or common sense that lives on. His philosophy was more focused on the material side of life to the point that he thought the Islamic promise of sensual pleasures, i.e. virgins and afterlife, was a better motivator to do good in this life compared to the Christian promise of spirituality in the afterlife. In other words, we humans find material or physical pleasures far more enticing than spiritual pleasures. This was the first seeds of materialism that arrived in Europe to transform science and philosophy and ground everything on the material world rather than spiritual or metaphysical realms. In other words, his emphasis on the practical side of intellect and knowledge brought sciences and religion together. However, the Islamic world ignored his pragmatism and dived deeper into spirituality, but this practical intellectual endeavor found itself a new home in Europe. Also important to note that Averroes was born and lived most of his life in Islamic Spain within the continental Europe, so he was perfectly placed to bridge Islamic world with a Christian Europe. Renaissance Europe European scholars and scientists read and absorbed Islamic philosophy and science and also through the works of Islamic scholars, they reconnected with the Greek philosophy and science. It gave rise to what is called the scientific revolution in the 15th and 16th centuries in Europe. Now faith and religion were severely challenged by a new empirical and practical science that studied the world through a rigorous scientific method. Galileo, Copernicus, and Newton were the pioneers of material science which became the basis of modernity. 
As science became more sophisticated in Europe and people learned a great deal about the natural world, some scientists turned their attention to solving the mystery of the human mind. It's like the scientists turn their microscope on themselves. The most famous Renaissance philosopher and scientist who tackled the mind was René Descartes, whose famous thought experiment of 1649 gave us the most famous line in philosophy. To prove that we exist, he imagined nothing existed. Then he concluded that at least the person who imagines or doubts or thinks this idea of non-existence has to exist. So I think therefore I am became the most famous line in philosophy. Descartes also believed that mind and body were two separate entities, which today is known as Cartesian dualism. But around this time, there was another huge shift in Europe. With the advancement of sciences and discoveries, people's belief in God and religion was shaken. Many scientific discoveries, including Copernicus and Galileo arguing that we are orbiting the sun, not the other way around, contradicted the religious view of the world. That solid belief in the supreme God ruling the world was severely challenged. For thousands of years, humans relied on gods protecting them and offering them refuge in heaven like children who rely on their parents for protection and comfort. This soft, protective, loving environment is also created by God in heaven. When you die, you return to your childhood. But now science is busting a lot of religious myths. Santa is not real. This godless vacuum created a psychological shift as people no longer believed there was a God protecting them from the tragedies of life. This era, 18th and 19th century, is also called the Enlightenment or waking up to the idea that rationality is the only true supreme power we have. The belief in the divine power didn't seem too convincing, at least among the intellectuals and elites of Europe. This freedom from God came with a huge responsibility. Now, your reason or rationality was the only weapon against life's tragedies. While rationality is an amazing tool to make our physical life better through technology and medicine, it provides very little when it comes to our psychological happiness or fulfillment in life. While the majority of the poor struggled with life, toiling and the physical pain of not having enough to eat, the rich Europeans, however, had a different problem. They believed that once you have enough wealth, you will be happy turned out not to be true. Some of the rich Europeans had miserable lives. What was going on? Science could help you with physical pain, but it couldn't help you with mental pain and psychological suffering. So people started asking questions and probing into the human mind to understand why we suffer. Early Pioneers One of the earliest philosophers who tackled the question of suffering was Arthur Schopenhauer, the German philosopher today nicknamed as the Great Pessimist. His 1819 book, The World as Will and Representation, revolutionized philosophy, shifting the attention from religion and rationality to the human subconscious. He understood that wealth, fame, status, beauty, and all the good stuff were mere surface level, but there was a giant beast underneath it all. We strive to become rich, powerful, more beautiful, and famous, but it's not actually us who is seeking them. It is this hidden beast inside each one of us that wants those things. The beast is using us to get wealth, fame, status, beauty, and all the objects of desire. But who is this beast? Why do we never see it? Schopenhauer articulated the beast as the blind will that rules every one of us. Not just us, this will rules all beings and the whole universe. The will doesn't belong to you or me, it has its own agenda. It merely uses us to achieve its goal. Goal? Actually, the blind will has no goal. It has no shape. It has no limit. It's like a bottomless well. Schopenhauer argued that we cannot see the will and all we understand about the world is a mere representation of that will. He called it will to life. Deeply instinctual and we subconsciously follow what this will wills. I should point out that this notion of hidden blind will was very much part of Eastern philosophy for thousands of years. But what's remarkable about Schopenhauer was that he articulated it so well that it made sense for the Europeans who were highly rationalistic in their approach. It's no surprise that the first psychology lab was created in Germany, so Schopenhauer's influence on psychology is massive. 
But before I tell you about the first psychology lab, there was one more massive development in Europe. In 1859, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection revolutionized science and philosophy, but also severely shook the foundation of religious beliefs. Again, I think Darwin must have read or have been influenced by Schopenhauer directly or indirectly. And Darwin's evolutionary theory gives scientists more freedom and leeway to probe into the human mind because we are evolved animals after all. Since we are evolved animals, then our psyche can be studied just like other animals. It's no longer only the domain of God and church. So in the late 19th century, psychology became a new field of study in Europe. Universities opened their psychology departments to understand psychological illnesses that were on the rise. But also the human mind was a new frontier and a mysterious place that attracted a lot of young men to explore. 19th century Europe was the age of exploration. Some people like Darwin traveled around the world in search of new discoveries and some stayed in their labs to discover what was going on inside the human mind. As psychology started to grow, three different psychological approaches emerged, the German, Russian, and Anglo-American. In Germany, psychology was part of the science faculty, mainly medicine, while in the Anglo-Saxon world, psychology departments were considered under philosophy. The Germans took an analytical approach, breaking things down to its smaller parts like a machine or car to understand how it works while the Anglo-Saxon preferred a more theoretical approach, understanding the bigger picture, the sum, not the parts, perhaps due to the British and American psyche of ruling the entire world through the British Empire and American domination. As a result, the German approach falls under psychoanalysis tradition, while the American falls under cognitive psychology, and the Russian focused on behavioral psychology. Of course, I'm making generalizations here. You can find exceptions within each of these three traditions. Science works in generalization. In 1879, the first psychology lab was created by Wilhelm Wundt at the University of Leipzig in Germany. He used himself as a lab rat to analyze how the human mind worked. He took a Tolstoyan approach. To understand something, we have to go back in history, event by event, until you reach the origin. His approach was like finding the source of the Nile, so you have to search for its tributaries and smaller parts. Wundt's conclusion was that the human mind starts at birth, and as we grow, it becomes more and more complex as it matures. I'll discuss his psychology in more detail later on. Around the same time in 1890s, Ivan Pavlov, a Russian physiologist, took a more scientific approach by experimenting on animals. He concluded that animals can be conditioned to behave in certain ways. For example, you can train animals like dogs by giving them treats. His research paved the way for a new school of psychology called behaviorism. The old adage that you cannot teach an old dog new tricks, but you can certainly train a puppy by exposing it to certain conditions and it will behave in the way you want. The nature versus nurture debate has always been with us, so Pavlov emphasized that the environment has a huge role in how we behave. While both Wund and Pavlov were white gown lab scientists, there were a lot of armchair psychologists who were replacing the old school church confessions with psychotherapy or the so-called talking cure. Before psychotherapy, if you had psychological baggage, you would go to your church pastor and make a confession to unburden yourself. But in the 19th century, people turned to doctors and psychotherapists. One of the most famous of these, of course, is Sigmund Freud, often called the father of psychotherapy. Unlike Wundt and Pavlov, who worked in their labs, Freud drew on his own observation of real people, mainly his own patients. So he was in the field, so to speak, and concluded that there was something far deeper than what we can see. He came up with a new realm of consciousness, which he called the unconscious, where we hide our traumatic childhood memories, sexual urges. As we grow up, we suppress a lot of things inside, so expressing those memories can be cathartic. So psychotherapy or the talking cure was born. 
In the 1950s, after two world wars, almost everyone in the world was traumatized and beaten down, so there was a huge shift in people's mood. The USA claimed victory and Europe was turned into rubble and ashes. Also, a lot of German psychologists fled to America, first due to Nazism and later due to communism in Eastern Europe. America became the land where individuals and ideas could flourish somewhat more freely. This American individualism gave rise to a new kind of psychology, cognitive psychology. Behaviorism, psychotherapy, and psychoanalysis all lacked one key feature. While you can condition someone to behave in a certain way, you can unlock someone's traumatic past by letting them talk, but you couldn't really make people more competent or smarter to take control of their own lives. So the American cognitive psychology focused on making individuals more competent, more skilled, more robust as individuals. Cognitive psychology, a bit similar to the self-help industry, champions positive thinking and positive perception. In other words, the way you perceive something says a lot about you. Also interesting to note that cognitive psychology was born around the same time as computers. Just like computers, the study of how our mind processes information became highly important. How we understand things, solve problems, remember things, and even how to cure psychological illnesses through cognitive therapy. Cognitive therapy, while not completely excluding the subconscious or environmental conditioning, puts the responsibility on the individual. Forget about your past conditioning or childhood traumas. What can you do about it now? You're not a victim, but a responsible agent who can change things. So cognitive psychology has that American optimism, which the German psychoanalysis or the Russian behaviorism lacked. With the dominance of cognitive psychology, the attention shifted to society. As decades passed, sociology, especially the French postmodernist version, grew into a robust discipline to study the role of society on the individual. So social psychology was born. Social psychology studies the group side of our psychology, how we perceive, behave in groups. So social psychology study power dynamics, obedience, altruism, violence, and the influence of education system, all deconstructed through the French postmodern lens. With the microscope on the role of education system on individuals came child psychology. How to educate the kids in the best way. Now all of a sudden Freud made sense. If childhood is the most critical period in one's life, one ought to study it. Not just that, society has a duty to educate its children to become good citizens. But then came the backlash that the education system was creating uniform citizens. Why? Because while the education system has many positive sides, as it allows children the opportunity to learn, it has an extremely negative side too. It focuses too much on standard and conformity, which kills children's unique and original creative sides. We ought to celebrate differences. Then came the psychology of difference. What are the differences between the sexes, even among different cultures and races? How can we evolve differently? So evolutionary psychology focuses on the history of human evolution. So to sum up, philosophy was the mother of all sciences in ancient Greece and Rome. But as humans develop more sophisticated knowledge of the world, we learn more about the natural world, philosophy became too complicated as a discipline, so it gave birth to many children, each specializing in tackling specific questions. For example, physics and chemistry took over the study of the physical world. Then in 19th century, biology took over the study of life. And then in late 19th century, early 20th century, philosophy gave birth to psychology to study the human mind. Of course, there is also a branch of biology called physiology that studies the functions of the brain and the nervous system. But the mind has become the domain of psychology in today's world. What's the difference between psychology and philosophy? The main difference between philosophy and psychology lies in the question they ask. Philosophy generally asks why questions or tries to find the reason behind ideas, thoughts, or why we have a mind in the first place. 
Psychology, on the other hand, asks how questions. For example, how the mind works, how thoughts and ideas come to us, and how the mind breaks down. To fully understand the two different disciplines, let's imagine Shakespeare's Hamlet holding a skull in front of him and asking questions. If Hamlet was a physiologist, he would hold the skull and ask how the stuff inside the skull, i.e., the brain matter, works on a mechanical level. If he was a philosopher, he would ask why this thing exists in the first place. Does it exist or not? If he was a psychologist, he would ask what happened to my father and damn my childhood. Joking aside, psychologist Hamlet would ask how the stuff inside this skull controls my body, my life, and my behavior. So that was a brief history of psychology in the West and around the world. Of course, it has far more complexities than can be fully conveyed here. So with the invention of psychology as a separate discipline in the 19th century, it grew to become more complex with its own unique approaches, schools, and ideas. The German school of psychoanalysis broke the human mind down into smaller parts, while the Russian behaviorists saw how we can be conditioned to behave in certain ways. And the American school of cognitive psychology focused on how to empower the individuals despite the handicaps of subconscious or the environmental conditioning. In the next segment, I'll answer the big question, what is psychology? And more specifically, what is consciousness? I'll discuss the various psychological approaches and branches of psychology. I'll also try to answer why we have psychology and what its main purpose is. Two, what is psychology? Previously, I talked about the origin of psychology and give you a brief history of psychology, its philosophical origin and a brief overview of its development in Europe and its various branches such as psychoanalysis, behaviorism, cognitive psychology, social psychology, and child psychology. In this segment, I'll dive a bit deeper into what psychology studies, or more precisely, what the human mind is. I'll discuss how modern psychology leans more on the material side of the mind rather than the spiritual or divine notion of the soul, which was the case throughout history. I'll also tell you a few important psychological terms and branches of psychology that will help you in the subsequent sections. To illustrate psychology and the human mind, let me give you a computer analogy. There's a belief that humans are just machines, so let's run with that. Let's assume we are a smartphone or a computer. I said before, physiologists study the brain or the hardware where the thought and ideas occur. Without the hardware or neural wirings, there is no idea or thought. For all we know, a rock cannot think, as far as we know. For philosophers, the focus is more on the software or applications. Why do we have such and such software and what are their purposes? Psychologists sit somewhere in the middle between the hardware and the software. Therefore, psychology is more concerned with the operating system and how the thoughts are processed and how it impacts the subject, i.e. us. So the brain and the nervous system is the hardware, the mind or the psyche is the operating system, and the thoughts and ideas or software or applications that function in conjunctions between the hardware and the software. So psychology mainly deals with the operating system, how it bridges the hardware with the software, or how the mind bridges the brain with thoughts, ideas, and most importantly, our behaviors. Now to understand what psychology is, first we need to ask a fundamental question. What is the human mind? Is it just a few brain cells fused together? Or is there something deeper than that? Is it just matter or soul? In philosophy, two opposing schools have battled for centuries. On the one hand, we have materialism stating that everything is in essence matter, from tiny atoms and cells. Today, most scientists, especially physicists, believe that there is nothing beyond matter, so they are materialists. Idealism, on the other hand, argues that everything is based on ideas. The Greek giant Plato argued that everything that exists is a mere copy or shadow of a perfect form that only exists as an idea. 
In most religions, this perfection is often referred to as the God that created all the matters we see. But God himself is invisible because it doesn't matter. So one of the biggest dichotomies in psychology is mind versus matter, or materialism versus idealism, mind-body dualism. Evolutionary biologists would argue that the mind is just an evolved tool to help us navigate life. It connects our brain with our nervous system to interact with the environment. The mind has some pre-installed software like the instincts to eat, have sex and find company. And these instincts have evolved over millions of years. But it's also open to learning and evolution. As we grow, the mind grows with us to help us adapt to changes in life. The philosophy of materialism goes along these lines. There is no soul, nor God, nor spirit. Everything is evolved as a means to an end, mainly for the sake of survival. The answer to the question as to why humans are so much more intelligent than other animals is simply because we had to deal with different challenges compared to other animals. Some animals prioritize speed like cheetahs, some height like giraffes, some brain size like humans, and some cooperation like bees. It's simply a means and end, how to survive and thrive in a merciless nature. The Greek philosopher Plato, on the other hand, argued that matter is secondary to ideas. For him, everything that exists only exists because of an ideal form. The ideal form only exists as ideas. Reality is just a poor shadow of those ideas. So he argued that our essence is separate from the physical matter like atoms and bones and flesh. The philosophical school of German idealism, including Immanuel Kant, George Haeckel, and Arthur Schopenhauer, agreed with Plato that ideas override matters. So psychology is the analytical branch of German idealist philosophy. One of the biggest schools of materialism is Marxism, developed by the German philosopher and economist Karl Marx, who took Hegel's history-based philosophy and married it to modern science to create a new school of materialism. Marx famously said that religion is the opiate of the masses. Marx believed that we are motivated by material things. The idea of soul or spirit or God or nothing but made up to numb the pain of not having enough material things in the world. For Marx, the poor working class, instead of having access to the material resources in society, go to church to console themselves, just like a drug addict who uses opiates to numb the pain of harsh existence. So Marx would base his psychology on materialism. Basically, we invent ideas, religions, drugs, and everything in between to cope with a lack of enough material needs. We are a simple animal made of matter and seeking matter and coping with ideas or imaginary things when we don't have enough material objects. Put simply, we imagine things we do not possess. As soon as you have them, you can no longer imagine them. So today, psychology in general leans more on the side of the material science and less on ideas or soul or philosophy. Today, the terminology is less philosophical or religious, but more scientific. Psychology itself has branched out based on what questions psychologists have asked. The three main branches are behaviorism, psychoanalysis, and cognitive psychology. Three branches of psychology. The early psychologists took a physical approach to the discipline, but it turned out the mind was a little more difficult to break down into its physical parts because of the deeper subconscious mind as well as instincts. So how do you study the invisible mind? There are a few ways to know the mind, observing behavior, listening to the patient talking, and recording changes over time. The German psychoanalysis focused on patients talking. Allowing people the freedom to talk gives a window into their childhood memories through which you can have a glimpse of their subconscious mind. Not only could the patient describe their state of mind, but the mere act of talking seemed to bring change in the mind, often cathartic. So psychoanalysis and psychotherapy went hand in hand. To understand the mind, you have to listen to the person. Sigmund Freud popularized the talking cure in which patients would lie down, talk openly without someone judging them. Not only was it therapeutic, it also opened a window into the person's mind. 
Today, this method is widely practiced in the developed world where patients spend hours and hours on therapy with a psychiatrist or a counselor. People in the developing world do not have the means or are less prone to seek therapy. Another famous psychologist was the Swiss Carl Jung, whose theory of the collective unconscious manifested itself in myths and literature, specifically through archetypal characters within storytelling. While Freud was talking to people, Jung was reading myths and stories that have survived for thousands of years. While Freud focused on the individual, Jung focused more on the collective side of our unconscious. While psychoanalysis became extremely popular, two important criticisms remained unanswered. One, it is hard to generalize based on individual patients telling their stories or relying on myths to fully understand the human psyche. And the second problem was that people often lie and make up stories and stories are just made up. In other words, it's fiction, not fact. So not everyone is telling the truth. So to overcome these two problems of subjectivity and unscientific storytelling, another school of psychology was born to make it more scientific. Behaviorism, instead of listening to people talk, observe the subject's behaviors and actions. The old adage that don't listen to what people say, instead watch how they act. The way people behave can tell us far more accurately what's going on in the mind. So behaviorist psychologists study not only what their subjects say, but also observe what they do. Action speaks louder than words. But just as psychoanalysis had some shortcomings, behaviorism too had some shortcomings. One of its biggest problems was that human behavior is not set in stone, it can be learned and changed. In other words, the human mind is far more complex than our behavior can show. Another problem with behaviorism was that knowledge impacts behavior. Not just that, the observer can change what is observed. Just like in quantum physics, the mere act of observation changes how the subject behaves. So consciousness is more complex than just behavior. So psychologists shifted their attention on our cognitive ability and how our knowledge can shape our behavior. So a new branch of psychology focused on the learning process, which is called cognitive psychology. It studies the connection between someone's perception, intelligence, memory, problem-solving ability, and more, and their behavior. In other words, how knowing and learning things change one's behavior. So cognitive therapy, similar to psychotherapy, argues that knowing something or learning something can have an impact on someone's behavior. Within cognitive psychology, we have social psychology, how individuals behave within a group dynamics or how a group behaves against another group. Also child psychology, how children learn and grow and how the education system can be utilized effectively to teach children positive behavior. But the most fundamental question in psychology is consciousness. Consciousness, subconsciousness and unconsciousness. Human animals are the most sophisticated when it comes to cognitive ability. No other animal comes close. Our level of cognitive ability allows us to see things far more crispier than other species. But consciousness is far more mysterious than it may appear. There are different levels to it. In other words, it has so many chambers and we are only aware of its upper chamber, more, most accessible to us which allows us to make decisions and choices in life. We often think what we do is our own free will. In other words, whatever we do, our decisions on a daily basis are based on our free choices. You chose to watch this video. You chose to eat the lunch you ate. You chose your partner. You chose your clothes. These choices are done on a conscious level, which means we are aware of what we do. However, there is a deeper layer to consciousness which we are not aware of. The subconscious mind is when we are not fully aware of what we do. For instance, when walking, we are often not conscious of taking each step. It is done almost automatically. We can focus on something else while walking. 
Sometimes subconscious and unconscious are used interchangeably. The unconscious mind is the deepest level of consciousness. If you think of a well, consciousness is the top level. You fully see it. The subconscious is mid-level, half dark and half lit. The unconscious is the bottom level, which is too dark to see. But when it comes to our behavior and actions, we might think we make decisions and choices on a conscious level. But psychologists agree that most of what we do in life is determined by the unconscious. In other words, when we choose a mate, it's more unconscious than conscious. Who we are attracted to is often an unconscious decision. As I discussed before, Schopenhauer argues that our free will is extremely limited. The fact that you select certain clothes, certain foods, etc. reveal a deeper subconscious level bias that we are not even aware of. First, we have deeper instincts. Food, sex, and company are the three most basic human instincts, which means we have no choice but to obey these urges. We eat to survive, we procreate to pass on our genes and seek company of others because our survival depends on the group we are in. We have no choice in these matters at all. Those decisions are made for us by our natural instincts. Even the mere act of watching this video might also not be conscious because this subject itself triggered something inside you. In other words, what we are drawn to is triggered somewhere deeper than consciousness. According to Psychoanalysis School of Psychology, most of the mental illnesses are because of our deeper unconscious desires hitting a brick wall called reality. As Schopenhauer said, the blind will has no purpose, so when life is good, it needs some chaos to steer us in some way. It has been proven that mental illnesses are far more prevalent in affluent countries than poorer countries. Because in poor countries, the outside reality is chaotic enough that the blind will have to deal with. In affluent countries, life is no longer a battle for survival, so the mind has to create newer chaos and dramas. Horror movies, dangerous sports and addictions replace the chaos of survival in a safe and comfortable society. Consciousness also includes ego, the rational side of the human mind that controls, often suppresses and regulates the instinctive impulses and urges. So consciousness is this dynamic back and forth between the upper conscious rationality and those at a base level of unconscious instinctual forces. Wolfgang Kohler, who lived between 1887 and 1964, was an Estonian-born German psychologist who along with a few other psychologists developed what is called Gestalt psychology. It basically means that human perception of reality is a complex system, but also very dynamic. According to the Russian behaviorist Pavlov, animals learn through trial and error or back and forth conditioning which you could say was perhaps very cyclical, meaning it was contained and limited to only animals responding to outside stimulus. In other words, the animals were incapable of thinking about the solution, but merely reacting to the stimuli. But Kohler argued that animals also use something called intelligence to give them a deeper insight into the process that speeds up learning. A great example is the invention of new tools and technology. He saw how chimpanzees solve problems not only through trials and errors, but also through insight and intelligence. In other words, after many trials and errors, there is also a breakthrough or a moment of insight. His psychology was a progressive learning. Trial and error leads to a newer insight, and the future generations built upon this foundation to continue the progress. In philosophy, this is very similar to George Hegel's progressive history through dialectical process. This dynamic learning system is called Gestalt psychology, which is a more holistic approach. So Pavlov's behaviorism saw animals as somewhat passive learners, while Gestalt psychology saw them as active and dynamic learners. In 1935, he fled Germany and settled in America, where cognitive psychology became prevalent and where individual innovation and productivity was championed. Now, let me answer one of the most important questions you might have. What is the purpose of psychology? 
Psychology is a discipline came out of philosophy to respond to the modern condition when faith in God and church declined. Humans were becoming the masters of earth, so any problems needed solving were left to science to solve. While its origin is in philosophy, its practical origin is offering help to people with psychological problems. In the 19th century, hysteria was a phenomenon, particularly common among women. Psychotherapists in Europe offered services to patients. Before the scientific revolution, people sought help in churches and local parishes, but now they visited psychiatry clinics. With the advancement of medicine, mental illnesses were treated in the same way as other physical illnesses. People visited a clinic to get help from a professional psychotherapist. Outside the mental clinics or asylums, psychology was used to dig deeper into the human mind to understand what makes us tick. This was more driven by curious minds, but also by companies to develop drugs, offer medical help, but also in the areas of education and advertising. Schools employ counselors, psychologists, hospitals employ psychiatrists, sports clubs employ psychologists. So psychology became a tool for competition among companies. Companies who understood the human psyche could sell more and get ahead of their rivals. But it also poses some serious questions. The biggest problem psychology faces is that it's highly subjective. We are scientists as well as the patients or subjects. Psychology is like a mirror looking at a mirror. Due to its subjectivity, it's highly exploitable. In some parts of the world, psychology has become a tool for drug companies to sell highly addictive drugs. Another use of psychology is to understand the human mind enough to target the subconscious mind through advertising in order to sell other products for dopamine rush, chemical that makes you feel good, not that you need the product. Another use of psychology has been ideological. Once we penetrate the human mind, you can also bend it in a way that fits your narrative, your ideology. So psychology is a relatively young discipline, but an extremely powerful weapon in today's world. To sum up, psychology is mainly founded on the idea of material science and less on the spiritual or divine notion of the human mind. Psychology mainly studies consciousness through our behavior and our cognitive abilities. It has developed into a robust science, so much so that companies and governments employ psychologists to make policies. Today, the biggest battleground of psychology is gender identity, for example, which has become highly political in some Western countries. In the next segment, I'll discuss consciousness from various perspectives. Is it a system or is it a functional entity? In other words, is consciousness a system that is set up or has it just grown out of necessity? Three, consciousness, structure versus function. Previously, I discussed the history of psychology, its various branches. In the debate between materialism and idealism, psychology tends to focus more on the material side as it applies methods used in material sciences. In this segment, I'll look at consciousness through two different approaches in psychology. On the one hand, we have structuralism that sees consciousness as a holistic system that we're born with and we slowly get to know it as we grow up. Functionalism, on the other hand, analyzes consciousness through its functions and argues that consciousness doesn't really understand itself. So structuralism has an optimistic outlook that one day we will understand consciousness, while functionalism is more pessimistic, that consciousness may never understand itself. Consciousness in Latin means knowing with, so it has a social or interpersonal an even moral connotation, somewhat similar to the word common sense. In a literal sense, it's a tool for knowing others. But of course, today we think of consciousness being more individual, generally referring to our awareness of the world, ourselves, our intentions, emotions, and sensory experiences. It's a window that we see the world with, but it's also a window that sees itself. 
Consciousness as a mechanism allows us to be aware of our environment, ourselves, our ideas, and generally to make sense of the world. But awareness is just one component of consciousness. The greatest mystery of consciousness is the power of self-awareness. In other words, consciousness is like a computer that knows its own existence. Not only that, it can also grow, meaning our awareness can increase as well as decrease. This makes it tricky to understand what it is and how it came about and how it works. For thousands of years, humans, mainly philosophers, have tried to understand how the human mind works. Even to this day, nobody really knows how consciousness works. Today we divide consciousness into three different layers. The conscious at the top, the subconscious in the middle, which is a bit muddled, and finally the unconscious at the bottom of the well that is dark and often unreadable through our conscious torch. In modern psychoanalysis, it's often agreed that the part unseen seem to have a huge influence on our lives, as Sigmund Freud argued. The first philosopher to tackle the question of consciousness was the French philosopher and scientist René Descartes. He saw it as our God-given ability to think and make sense of the world. As a rationalist philosopher, he thought we were born with the ability to reason and think, so our consciousness had very little to do with the outside world. It was given to us by God. But the British philosopher John Locke, a pioneer of empiricism, argued that we learn everything through experience. In other words, we learn things through our interaction with the outside world. In his famous 1690 work, Essay Concerning Human Understanding, he defines consciousness as the perception of what passes in someone's mind. In other words, whatever we see, hear, smell, taste, or touch allow us to perceive things and consciousness basically registers all those sensory data. So Locke's philosophy was influenced by the natural sciences and he in turn influenced future philosophers who grounded their ideas more on the concrete and less on the abstract. Johann Friedrich Herbert, who lived between 1776 and 1841, was a German philosopher. He was interested in how our conscious mind worked. He was curious, since we get so many ideas on a daily basis and we are bombarded with sensory information overload, yet our mind seems to sort things out pretty well to keep us less confused about the world. How does the mind do it? He used magnetism as an analogy for how the conscious mind works. Consciousness, he argued, works in reverse, meaning the opposite repels while the same attracts. When similar ideas or patterns come together, they form a bigger or complex idea and concept. But when two contradictory ideas come to mind, they battle it out. The losing idea is not destroyed, but it falls down into a darker part of consciousness or a storage space, which we call the unconscious. They remain there until Sigmund Freud comes along to tell us what happens next. Those ideas in the subconscious do appear from time to time to haunt us, terrify us, and even pleasantly surprise us, for example in the works of Marcel Proust in Search of Lost Time. So consciousness for Herbert was a well-developed sorting system like one used in post offices. Our senses send information to our mind and our conscious mind sorts things out. It keeps the useful information at ready and not useful information is sent down to the unconscious storage space as clutter. To sum up, Herbert was the first philosopher psychologist to tackle how our conscious mind deals with sensory information and he was also the first to identify two levels of consciousness, the conscious and the unconscious, which influenced future psychologists such as Freud. So he was a pioneer of a psychological approach called structuralism who asked how consciousness worked. In other words, he saw consciousness as a sorting structure, like post office with different rooms. Wilhelm Wundt, born in 1832 and died in 1920, is generally considered the true pioneer of psychology because he founded the first psychology lab at the University of Leipzig in 1879. 
Interestingly, his father was a Lutheran minister, just like the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who lived around the same time as him. Wundt, influenced by Darwin, believed that all living organisms, including animals and plants, had consciousness. In fact, he saw life itself as a mental process. It's important to point out that in Germany, the greatest philosophers like Kant, Hegel, Schopenhauer, and others believed in the primacy of idea over matter. The mental side of life was far more important than the physical side. The German school of idealism and philosophy has been immensely popular, not only in Germany, but throughout the world. So Wundt also subscribed to the idea that life from the very beginning was mental as well as physical. So he believed that the true purpose of psychology was to describe consciousness. To prove his hypothesis, Wundt didn't sit in his chair. He got his hands dirty by dissecting frogs like a true scientist. Just as Aristotle turned philosophy into an empirical science, Wundt made philosophy into an experimental psychology. But the biggest challenge for any psychological experiment was that consciousness is not simply an external phenomena like in physics or biology, it's mostly internal. But this didn't deter Wundt. Wundt saw consciousness as a structure or a machine that can be broken down into smaller parts that can be studied. German science tends to be more analytical, breaking things down to its smaller parts or elements that each can be analyzed separately. He found subjects, real people, and showed them a beam of light. He measured the light's color, intensity, and duration. He then observed their reaction, either voluntary or involuntary. On top of that, he also asked the participants to describe the sensations they felt. He was thorough in his job, just like a true stereotypical German. He concluded that our consciousness is born out of our sensation depending on the quality, intensity, and the type of feeling it triggers. For example, a smell triggers a certain sensation depending on its quality of good or bad, intensity, strong or weak, and feeling pleasant or unpleasant. Wundt put consciousness into three categories, representation, willing, and feeling. Representation simply means perception of visible images or intuitive imagination of memory of a particular thing, or even illusion, as Arthur Schopenhauer argued a few decades earlier. So representation simply means we find certain images, sounds, tastes, and so on, like trigger warnings, either to act or not to act, to eat or not to eat, so forth. Rotten food versus a delicious pizza is an easy one. One triggers you to be repulsed, and the other triggers you to eat. The second category of consciousness, which Wundt called willing, is our experience with the outside world, meaning it triggers us to act or not to act, run or not to run. So representation is the first warning trigger, and the willing is what we do with representation. The third category is feeling. So once we perceive something through representation, then we act as in willing and finally how we feel after the fact. This is similar to Schopenhauer's theory of the world as will and representation, which I covered in my philosophy course. But Schopenhauer only talked about the blind will that determines most of our actions and representation of that will is how we see the world. Wundt also conceded that the willing part was difficult to study as it is deeply internal. It is somewhat similar to intention, so it is always tricky to know the true intention of someone. You can study consciousness as a representation by providing the participant with images, sounds, smell, and so forth, which trigger certain acts or wills, either voluntary or involuntary. While the willing part is difficult to analyze, he asked the participants to describe how they felt. So Wundt concluded that the two categories of consciousness that can be studied are representation and feeling. The willing category, however, is difficult to study as it happens internally inside the person. Wundt conceded while consciousness was purely sensation-based, cultural aspects such as religion as well as language also played a role in shaping it. In other words, consciousness was developed through our interaction with the physical world, 
but our culture or nurture side of life also plays a crucial role in shaping our consciousness. So to sum up, Wundt pioneered experimental psychology by tackling the biggest elephant in the room, consciousness. He concluded that consciousness and life go hand in hand. Consciousness has three categories, representation, which is our intuitive perception of reality, willingness, which is an internal trigger that pushes us whether to act or not to act, and finally feeling, which is how we feel after the act or inaction. In other words, the process of consciousness goes like this. We sense something, we act, and then we feel. In 1959, Charles Darwin published his famous book on the origin of species in which he argued that humans have evolved from other animals through what he called the process of natural selection. Not only he revolutionized biology, its influence on philosophy was immense. It paved the way for philosophy to become more evidence-based, so a new discipline was born. Psychology came out to make philosophy of the mind a scientific endeavor. Around the same time as Wundt in Germany, there was an American philosopher-psychologist who saw consciousness somewhat differently. Not as a structure, but more like a stream with a specific functionality. Wundt belonged to the structuralist school of psychology that studied or understood the mind as a structure that could be broken down into smaller parts. American psychologists, however, favored a more Darwinian approach, which is called functionalism, which is related to evolutionary biology. According to Darwinian approach, species live and die based on how they adapt to the environment. In other words, in psychology, the mind or consciousness is an adaptive mechanism, not some solid structure that was bestowed upon us from God or somewhere else that can be broken down into smaller pieces. So one has to study it as a whole, not analyze its parts. William James, born in 1842, died in 1910, was an American philosopher, psychologist and artist. His brother, Henry James, was a great novelist. William James was the pioneer of psychology in the United States. While Wundt saw consciousness as somewhat a solid structure that can be broken down and analyzed separately, James followed in the footsteps of Charles Darwin and his evolutionary biology. As I discussed, Wundt asked what consciousness was, while James asked what it did or how it functioned. He asked a very specific question, how does our consciousness tackle the problem of sensory overload? At any given moment, our consciousness is overloaded with sensory information. It's like a river or a waterfall gushing with information. He used river as a good metaphor for consciousness, which also became a literary style, particularly in the works of James Joyce, Virginia Woolf and others, in which they wrote about characters who instead of carefully formulating and articulating ideas, express their inner thoughts and monologues just like a stream that runs without stop. This is called the stream of consciousness. So William James wanted to understand how our consciousness functioned. James saw it as a process like evolution, not an outcome or solid foundation. For him, consciousness was more fluid than solid. When you see consciousness as a non-stop stream, it becomes highly tricky to define it. You need to plug the flow to really understand it. But the real question is that despite the overflow of information, our mind seems to function pretty well and we don't get overwhelmed most of the time. There has to be a mechanism by which our mind copes with the non-stop stream of consciousness. James, just like Herbert, understood that the mind must categorize or combine ideas and information to make it easy for us. Just as farmers use channels and furrows to control river water for irrigation, our mind also must have a mechanism by which it controls the overflow of information. To understand William James, let's go back to the German giant Immanuel Kant. The German philosopher argued that the human mind imposes a structure to the outside world. We are not passive receivers of information from outside, but an active participant in imposing a structure to the outside world. James argued that the river that runs inside our mind is not a constant river, but it sometimes pauses to take a break to reflect. 
This reflective moment allows us to assess things. If you stand under a waterfall, soon you will be overwhelmed by the amount of water and make it hard to breathe. But if you have a switch like a shower, you have time to breathe and reflect. This allows our mind to sort things out and categorize things so we make sense of the world. James also argued that consciousness doesn't have a specific course or bed, instead it shifts from part to part. So I would say for William James, consciousness is more like a cascade than a stream. Instead of flowing smoothly, information often jumps and falls. So each person is a different cascade through which our conscious ideas flow and move about. William James also developed a theory of emotion with a fellow psychologist named Lang. They argued that emotions are tied with actions. In other words, certain actions trigger emotions. For example, when you see a wild animal, before you feel fear, you start to flee. The feeling of fear only comes after you become aware that you are running. In other words, your feeling of fear develops through the perception of the act of running, which also raises your heartbeat, sweating, and so forth. So, fear results from your awareness of an action. Another example is you are only happy when you know you are smiling. This is somewhat counterintuitive because we think our happiness makes us smile or our fear makes us run. James and Lang argued that when it comes to the consciousness of emotions, we act and then become aware of emotions. In other words, we are not conscious of our emotions unless we see something change, for instance a smile or a frown. This is somewhat similar to Wundt's theory of consciousness as he too argued that willing or action comes before feeling. But what's the difference between feelings and emotions? To understand this, let's talk about a Dutch psychologist who made the distinction quite clear. Nico Freida, who lived between 1927 and 2015, was a Dutch psychologist, made a distinction between emotions and feelings. Emotions are unconscious, therefore we have no control over them. For example, fear, joy, anger, sadness, disgust, and shame. Feelings on the other hand are our interpretation of our emotions. For example, worry, irritation, frustration, grief, resentment, etc. In other words, emotions are the invisible part of the iceberg, while feelings are the visible tip. Feelings are tied to our conscious thoughts and we generally have control over them. We can choose to feel a certain way, but emotions are spontaneous. For example, when we see a dangerous animal, fear forces us to flee. Since emotions are deep, they affect our behavior and physiology so others can see our emotions. Feelings, however, don't impact our behavior and others tend not to see it. To sum up, William James saw consciousness as a fluid mechanism that runs like a river or cascades. In cascades, some information remains to form our memory. You could say that he was Kantian and that our mind is like a fishnet and it catches information needed. In other words, our consciousness is very much outcome driven and purposeful. It remembers what it does, so next time it has a choice to repeat or ignore. So consciousness is not some blind mechanism, it's quite a goal-oriented mechanism. Since consciousness is closely tied to memory, to really understand human memory, let's go back to 19th century Germany. Hermann Ebbinghaus, who lived between 1850 and 1909, was a German psychologist who studied memory. To work out how it worked, he tested his own memory by trying to remember two lists of works. One a list of meaningful words and then a list of 2300 nonsense syllables, each three letter long. He would look at the list for a second or two and then pause for 15 seconds. He repeated this process a few times until he could remember them. He recorded his result meticulously like any scientist would. What were his results? He found three interesting results. First, he realized that he could remember meaningful words significantly better than nonsensical words. So meaning is closely tied to memory. Second, he also noticed that the longer he spent memorizing something, the faster he could recite them. So the more time you spend remembering something, the better your memory is. 
And third, he also understood that the interval between seeing the words and reciting them also affected his memory. In other words, the longer he waited to recall, the harder it was. So as time passes, our memory loses most of the information. So he concluded that the content's meaning and duration of exposure and the length of the interval between exposure and recall affected his ability to remember. So our memory best retains information that is meaningful to us the more we time spend memorizing them and finally the quicker we are asked to recall them. In other words, our memory is goal-driven and time-efficient. This is no surprise, as we all know, revision before an exam actually works. And a week after exam, we tend to forget most of it. But what happens to the information we do not retain? In the late 19th century, a group of psychologists realized that below the conscious memory lies a whole different world. A grey subconscious or dark unconscious world where we keep some dark memories. We know that what we forget doesn't go away, it goes somewhere in our deeper subconscious that later comes to haunt us. In the late 19th century, hysteria was a huge phenomenon in Europe, mostly among women, but also affected men, especially soldiers, today known as PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. It basically meant an explosive outbursts of emotion, often uncontrollable, akin to some volcanic eruptions, would come out. Families were struggling to deal with their loved ones' emotional outbursts, often negative emotions. We know that volcanoes happen because the Earth's core is a molten rock, and sometimes it breaks through. So hysteria was something similar. There had to be a subconscious or unconscious chamber that erupted sometimes. One of the earliest to study the unconscious and memory was the French physician Pierre Janet, who lived between 1859 and 1947, who worked at a hospital in Paris in the 1880s and 1890s. His work predates Sigmund Freud's psychoanalysis, so some argue he was the true pioneer of the subconscious mind. He observed trauma among his patients who were terrorized by some past traumatic experiences. In other words, there was no terror in the present life, but it was inside the subconscious mind. So some past memories were haunting these people. He called this phenomena disassociation. What does it mean? Simply put, it means you are safe right now, but the past trauma is still inside you and telling you that you are not safe, hence the name disassociation. For Janet, this trauma that caused disassociation might or might not have happened to the person. If someone experiences a traumatic experience during their childhood, which they may have forgotten, it doesn't go away, but merely sits in the subconscious, and when triggered by something else, they resurface. But he also said the experience of dissociation could also happen to people without past trauma, because some people are more predisposed to feel that way. This perhaps hints at a Jungian collective unconscious and that we inherit some traumas from our past ancestors. For example, we all have nightmares such as falling down from high place, perhaps an experience passed down to us from our human ancestors as well as primate ancestors living in trees. Most people have nightmares while asleep, but those suffering from hysteria experience those nightmares during their waking hours. Sigmund Freud read Janet's book. While rejecting some of his ideas, he was immensely influenced by him. In the next section, I'll discuss Freud and Jung. So to sum up, psychologists have tried to understand consciousness. There were two approaches when it came to explaining consciousness. German structuralism led by Wilhelm Wundt and Anglo-American functionalism led by another Wilhelm, William James. For the structuralists, consciousness is like any structure that can be broken down to its parts and then those parts can be studied and analyzed. Wundt broke down consciousness into three parts, representation, willing and feeling, just like a house made up of exteriors, interiors and temperature regulation. 
So to put it crudely, structuralism sees consciousness as structure built by someone, i.e. God or someone else. If you see a machine or a house, your immediate reaction is that someone must have created it. So that's the structuralist view. But if you see a river, your immediate thought is not a creator, but rather you see it as an organic process, which is a functionalist view. Functionalists see consciousness as an adaptive mechanism that has evolved and it functions the way it does because it has evolved to solve problems of existence. It's more fluid rather than a solid structure. Consciousness changes and adapts and responds to its environment. While functionalism has more Anglo-Saxon roots thanks to Charles Darwin's influence, Structuralist School of Psychology has more German roots due to its influence of German idealist philosophers such as Kant, Hegel and Schopenhauer. Anglo-Saxon philosophy has traditionally prioritized pragmatism while the philosophy of the continental Europe prioritized ideas. I should also mention that in Russian-speaking world, another school of psychology was more prevalent which took a more physiological approach to the study of consciousness. So the Russians mostly focused on the brain studies and how consciousness and the brain are connected. This is partly due to communism, prioritizing materialism. So some of the most influential studies of the brain have been done in Russia and again it goes back to Pavlov who took a behaviorist approach to psychology. In the next segment, I'll focus on behaviorism and discuss the old debate between nature and nurture. How much of our behavior is determined by the outside condition or the environment we live in? Four, behaviorism, nature versus nurture. In the previous section, I discussed that there are two distinct approaches to the study of consciousness. In the German-speaking world, the psychological school of structuralism saw consciousness as a solid structure, perhaps built or pre-assembled. So to study it, it broke it down into smaller parts, just like a machine or a house. In the Anglo-Saxon world, however, there was a different approach to consciousness. Influenced by the evolutionary theory of Charles Darwin, the functionalist school of psychology saw consciousness for how it functioned as an adaptive mechanism. For the functionalists, consciousness is not as solid like a house, but very much fluid like a river. In the Russian-speaking world, however, the focus of psychology wasn't on philosophical questions on consciousness, but more on how our behavior can tell us about our consciousness. In other words, how consciousness manifests itself in our actions and behaviors. Do you behave because there's an innate structure telling us how to behave? Or do we behave because we learn to behave due to our environmental conditions? Nature versus nurture is one of the oldest debates in philosophy and psychology. Are animals programmed on an instinctual level to behave in certain way or are they capable of learning? This question was one of the very first that early psychologists tackled and we have come to know it as the behaviorist school of psychology. Behaviorism is one of the most important branches of psychology. Simply put, behaviorist psychologists study how humans and animals behave. Behaviorism as an approach began with animals for the obvious reason. It's a lot easier to carry out experiments on animals than humans. The second reason behaviorism started with animals is that animals cannot talk. So to study animals, you have no choice but to study how they behave. Unless you're a wizard. But behaviorism is also a more accurate way of understanding humans. Watch what people do, not what they say. Our actions speak louder than words. One of the very earliest experiments that kick-started behaviorism took place in 1890s in Russia, as well as in the United States around the same time. The father of behaviorism is the Russian and his greatest children are American. Ivan Pavlov, who lived between 1849 and 1936, was the son of a priest, just like Wilhelm Wundt, and was supposed to become a priest himself, but he changed his mind and instead studied medicine, which ultimately won him a Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1904. In the 1890s, he carried out a few experiments on dogs, in which he planted a device to measure the saliva secreted when dogs were offered food. 
which he called unconditioned stimulus. In other words, you see food, you know you want to eat it. It is simple association. You can do the same experiment on me, not with dog food, but with pizza. He soon noticed that whenever the dog was not shown directly, but it was implied through other signs, the dog also secreted saliva. In other words, the dogs did not clearly see the food, but they associated certain signs like bell, buzzer, or even light with food, therefore stimulating them to release saliva. This second degree stimulation he called conditioned stimulus. This conditioned response was a learned response. In other words, dogs were trained to associate food with certain sounds or light or person. So he concluded that animals were capable of learning as well as unlearning. When the stimulus was not followed by food, repeatedly the dogs learned not to anticipate food. We all know the story of the boy who cried wolf. If you repeatedly lie to animals, they no longer trust you. Today it's known as Pavlovian conditioning, in which animals learn to associate certain sounds, objects or people with food. Pavlov scientifically proved what humans had done for thousands of years, slowly domesticating certain animals with the promise of food. To sum up, Pavlov's experiment showed that animal behavior can be conditioned through a stimulus that promised food. In other words, the dogs didn't see food, but thought of food when they saw a sign which is nothing but a promise. Someone might do a lot for promise of a free lunch, me included. So we humans are no different from dogs, we learn by association and memory. While the Russians experimented on dogs, the American did a similar study of other domestic animals to understand how animals learn to behave in certain ways. Why or how do we learn the things we learn? Edward Thorndike, who lived between 1874 and 1949, was a US psychologist who did his experiments around the same time as Ivan Pavlov's. The Russian experimented with pets while the American chose another domestic animal, Kentucky Fried Chicken. I mean chicken. Thorndike built a series of mazes and led a bunch of chicks to navigate their way through the labyrinth in order to get food. He later carried out more experiments with cats. Instead of a maze, the cats were supposed to solve certain puzzles in order to get out and get food. He learned that the cats solved the puzzle through trial and error. But as they practiced solving more puzzles, the cats also found the next puzzle easier to solve. The more they practiced, the better they got. He concluded that learning is outcome driven, which he termed as the law of effect. When the animals solved the puzzle, their neural connections increased because the link between a situation and response solidified around that stimulus as a solid answer. But when they failed to solve a problem, their neural connection weakened and those responses were discarded quickly. So learning is heavily solution-oriented. Animals remember good outcomes and forget bad outcomes. Good outcomes solidify in the brain to reinforce a bias towards those solutions for future problems. In his famous book, Animal Intelligence, published in 1911, Thorndike concluded that animals learn not through insight as they lack rationality, but they learn through simple trial and error. For animals, good outcomes lead to good feedback and bad outcomes lead to bad feedback in the brain. To sum up, Thorndike concluded that in nature, learning is heavily outcome driven and ruthless. You don't get many chances to make too many mistakes. You either eat or get eaten, which keeps you on your toes when it comes to quick learning. This is evolution 101. Among animals, the quick learners live on to mate and slow learners die out without leaving any genetic legacy. So learning is an adaptive mechanism. But how does learning take place in the brain? In other words, how knowledge and brain matter collide? Is there a specific part of the brain where knowledge is stored? Carl Lashley, who lived between 1890 and 1958, wanted to know how learning takes place on a physiological level in the brain and cells. He removed parts of the rat's brain but noticed that they still retain what they had learned to some extent. 
He concluded that memory is not localized but takes place in the entirety of the brain. Not only the brain retains learning and memory, but even our muscles keep memories, which we conveniently call muscle memory. Riding a bike is something we do not forget because it's stored not only in the brain but also in our muscles. Lashley concluded that there is no physiological change as a result of learning. In other words, learning is not like photography in which you expose the chemicals to the light to capture a photo. There is a chemical reaction that leaves a mark, but animal brain is not like that. It's far more versatile. Even if you damage one area, the task is taken over by another area. But learning is not just a matter of the brain, but the timing is also crucial. For instance, we all know that younger children learn languages faster and better than grown-ups. It's true among animals too. The first psychologist to study age-specific learning was an Austrian. Conrad Lorenz, who lived between 1903 and 1989, was an Austrian psychologist who studied how young ducklings bonded with their mothers. But when the mother was absent, the little ducklings attached themselves to another duck, a foster parent. But what was interesting for him was that this bonding only happened at a certain age, typically at a young age. This is called imprinting. If the bond happens at a crucial stage of development, that bond cannot be forgotten. In other words, you cannot teach an old dog new tricks, but you can certainly do with younger animals. He concluded that at a deeper instinctual level, learning is very stage-specific or age-specific. Just like young ducklings can bond with a foster parent at a certain age, among humans, young people are far better at learning a language than older people. It is perhaps an adaptive mechanism in which our survival relies on how closely we bond with a parent or how quickly we learn the language of the community we live in. It ensures survival. Some psychologists, however, disputed that animals only learn instinctively. In some cases, our learning can override instincts. One of the most interesting experiments was done by a Chinese psychologist. To counter Lawrence's instinct-based psychology, Jing Yang Kuo, who lived between 1898 and 1970, was a Chinese psychologist. He put kittens in the same cage as rats to observe if they grow together and whether cats see rats only as food. Not only they didn't attack the rats, they played together as mates. He concluded that there is no such thing as instinct because cats didn't eat the rats if they lived with them. He argued that instead of finding nature in the animal, we should build nature in them. I wonder what would have happened if the cat was not given food or starved for a while. Would it instinctively eat the rat? But of course, this raises the ethical question of deliberately starving an animal. So far, we've just discussed experiments done on animals, but not on humans. This change in America in the 1920s by Sherlock Holmes, sidekick John Watson. I'm kidding, it's a different John Watson. John Watson, who lived between 1878 and 1958, was an American psychologist with a somewhat rocky childhood of his own due to his alcoholic dad and religious mother. Not just that, his career also had a rough patch as he was forced to resign due to his romantic affair with a colleague. While the previous psychologists did most of their experiments on animals, Watson wanted to observe humans, so he found a 9-month-old baby called Albert B. The purpose of the experiment was to find out if they could condition the baby to fear certain animals by accompanying that animal with scary noise. The baby was shown various animals like dogs, rats, monkeys, and rabbits. First, he was shown these animals and objects without the noise. As expected, the baby showed no fear of these animals. Then in the next step, the animal was paired with a loud, frightening noise. This resulted in the baby associating fear with the animals. Although such an experiment would not be possible today, it proved that Pavlov's conditioning applied to humans in the same way. What's worse, little Albert not only associated the white rat with fear, he was also frightened of anything similar to a white rat. 
So not only can we be conditioned to behave in certain way, our emotional response can also be conditioned. In other words, the environment a child grows up in has a massive influence on their behavior as well as their emotional response. John Watson advocated parents to take a proactive approach to child rearing, which some criticized as too rigid and factory-like approach. His own childhood must have influenced his work, as later psychologists thought while his findings were remarkable, his prescriptions were not very helpful. With behaviorism taking a firm root in America in the 20th century, it became much closer to Darwinian evolutionary biology that learning is not a luxury but a necessity of life. In other words, our survival necessity is the mother of all inventions and learning. B.F. Skinner, who was born in 1904 and died in 1990, considered the most famous behaviorist psychologist, was an American who, despite wanting to be a writer, turned to behavioral psychology. Building upon Pavlov and John Watson's research, but just like his fellow countryman Edward Thorndike, he concluded that learning is primarily outcome-driven or result-based. Instead of a neutral stimulus like Pavlov and Watson's sound stimulus, he developed a physical lever for the animals to operate in order to get food. His experimental subjects were rats in boxes that had a bar fitted in. When the animals pressed the bar, first out of curiosity or deliberately or accidentally, food would appear. It turns out the rats only continued to press the bar if they previously received food. Those rats who didn't get food decreased or stopped doing so, so the learning was based on positive outcome. As he continued his experiments, while varying slightly, the conclusion was that rats were also learning to adapt to the changes that were happening to their environment. Animals learn to respond to positive and negative reinforcements based on their previous experiences. Not only that, the rats responded to stimuli that reduced their negative reinforcement in the shape of electric shock. It turned out the rats learn better through positive reinforcement than negative ones. So reward is better than punishment, or carrots are better than sticks. Skinner also found that different rats responded differently to different stimuli concluding that rats' genetic makeup to a large part determine its intelligence or curiosity that favor them in the environment they are in. In other words, nature as well as nurture determine how a person or animal adapts to the environment they live in. Nature is the foundation while nurture is the walls and roofs. Skinner also questioned traditional education by offering a more feedback-based teaching approach in which the teacher and student interact more often, not waiting until the student is done with a project. A more interactive education is more effective. His psychology is known as radical behaviorism, arguing that free will is nothing but an illusion. He even coined the term selection by consequences in reference to Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection that our behavior is determined by the consequences of our action. It is not a passive learning process, but a somewhat dynamic one in which the subject presses a lever to receive food. In other words, we act and behave in a way that helps us get more positive outcomes and avoid negative outcomes. So to sum up, Skinner continued behaviorist psychology but added a more proactive mechanism in his tests to observe that animals basically learn and respond to positive consequences better. It's all good and dandy to know how we learn based on good outcomes, but an important question is how to unlearn things. So far we have only discussed how humans and animals learn, but we have not tackled the question how we can unlearn things. Fyodor Dostoevsky wrote about how we can be contaminated by bad ideas and it would be awesome if you could unlearn some terrible things. It would make life a bit easier to unlearn bad things we have learned, either voluntary or involuntary. The old saying that once learned cannot be unlearned, but our next psychologist is trying to show that we can actually unlearn things as we learn things. I discussed in Pavlov's experiments that we learn things by association, but we can also unlearn through association or dissociation. 
Joseph Wolpe, who was born in 1915 and died in 1997, was a South African-born American psychologist who is credited with a new technique in behavioral therapy. He understood that humans cannot be anxious and relaxed at the same time. If someone is relaxed, he is not anxious, and vice versa. He asked his patients to imagine the past events that gave them anxiety. When they showed signs of distress, he would ask them to stop imagining and relax. He would repeat this process a few times and within a short time, the patient would be reconditioned to associate the distressing events with feeling relaxed. This went against the psychotherapy practice that tried to get to the bottom of the trauma or to root cause to alleviate it. Instead, he focused on the symptoms and associated those symptoms with relaxation in the present. This technique of desensitizing the patient to their traumatic experience allowed reconditioning the brain to focus on the present relaxation, not the traumatic past events. So this went against the grain because in order to treat someone from past trauma, he introduced the past enough times so that patients felt desensitized. In other words, in order to get rid of a phobia, one has to touch the spider. It simply tricks the brain to associate fear or trauma with good stuff. If you add enough sugar to something bitter, it becomes sweet. To sum up, the Behaviorist School of Psychology started with Ivan Pavlov's environmental conditioning experiments. Then the Americans carried experiments on other animals and humans. Later on, the Russians focused more on the brain side as they saw psychology part of physiology and the Americans more focused on learning and education. So American behaviorists Skinner, Watson, Wolp, and others concluded positive reinforcements was better than negative ones. Today we associate positivity with Americans and brooding pessimism with the Russians. Behaviorists looked at how behavior was established in animals by restricting or providing conditions for a desired outcome. You can train a dog to behave in certain ways which often goes against their innate instinctive response. While those instincts cannot be eliminated through conditioning, animals have the capacity to learn and adapt to new conditions. So learning is closely tied to survival and adaptation to the environment. So we behave and learn to behave that guarantees our survival. Food is the best way to train an animal. While behaviorism looks at how animals and humans behave on the surface, the human mind is far more complex than simple behavior. There are layers of consciousness that are totally hidden from us. This question of hidden consciousness was a pressing issue in the German-speaking world. In my discussion between structuralism and functionalism, the Germans were more in favor of a structure than a functional mechanism, while behaviorism, which is closer to functionalism and Darwinian evolution, became a dominant approach in psychology in the US, and the German-speaking world psychoanalysis and psychotherapy dominated that discipline. Two of the most important figures in psychology came from the German tradition of analytical psychology. So they saw consciousness as a complex structure with different layers or chambers. Next, I'll discuss the Austrian Sigmund Freud and Swiss Carl Jung and the piece that is called the unconscious. Five, Carl Jung versus Freud, the battle of the unconscious. In the previous segment, I discussed how early psychologists carried out their experiments with animals to understand why they behave the way they do or how to condition animals' behavior. Later on, the experiments were conducted on humans and the results were the same, that humans too are subject to environmental learning. This approach pioneered by Ivan Pavlov in Russia but became widely popular in the United States, it became known as behaviorism. While behaviorism was an established scientific approach to psychology, in the German-speaking world there was this feeling that lab science truly couldn't explain everything. The human mind was far more mysterious or sophisticated than experiments and labs can truly understand. 
So this led to another approach in psychology, which became known as psychoanalysis, which has its roots in German structuralism of Wilhelm Wundt, who is considered the father of modern psychology. Instead of relying on behavior, psychoanalysis focused on understanding consciousness through two methods. First, they looked at mental illness and asked why the mind gets sick. Second, they looked at dreams and asked why we dream. This led the early psychoanalysts to the conclusion that consciousness is more complex than we can see or understand. There has to be another level to consciousness which is not really available to us. This became known as the subconscious or unconscious. Two of the most important psychoanalysts were the Austrian Sigmund Freud and the Swiss Carl Jung. So in this section, I'll discuss their approaches to psychology, their similarities and differences in the battle of the unconscious. While the previous generations of psychologists studied psychology in the lab through experimental psychology, some psychotherapists were in the fields dealing with people with mental problems. So their study was not based on lab experiments on animals or humans, but approached psychology through field observation. At the time, behaviorism was the dominant approach in psychology, to which studies were based on experiments. However, around this time, a new approach to psychology emerged from the field, mental asylums, hospitals, and psychiatry clinics, where psychologists observed their patients and discovered the existence and the power of the subconscious. One of the earliest pioneers of psychoanalysis was the French doctor Pierre Janet, who is credited to having both influenced Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung. However, when it comes to establishing psychoanalysis, it's Freud and Jung who stand out. Sigmund Freud, often called the father of psychoanalysis, and the Swiss Carl Jung agreed that the unconscious is perhaps a more powerful part of their consciousness. Despite their similarity in focusing on the unconscious, as the best source of understanding the human mind, they also had a few differences. Sigmund Freud, who was born in 1856 and died in 1939, was a practicing psychotherapist in Vienna, the capital of Austro-Hungarian Empire, and one of the most sophisticated cities in the world at the time. Despite its sophistication and wealth, there were a lot of people with mental issues. But why would such an affluent city have so many people suffering from psychological problems? Materially, people were well off and they had a few worries regarding survival necessities like food and shelter. There had to be something deeper than just material needs we humans crave. With science diminishing religious credibility, people had lost faith in God and church. Now each person had the responsibility to come up with a solid meaning for their lives. It's easier said than done. So Freud realized that there has to be something deeper than we are consciously aware of. He took the task of understanding what lies behind the conscious mind. Just like his predecessors, he took a structurist approach to the consciousness and came up with a three-level structure, the conscious, the preconscious, and the unconscious. He concluded the unconscious was the deeper well and the source of water and some of our thoughts and experiences. In other words, it's a hidden unconscious beast that determines some of what we think and do. And philosopher Schopenhauer called it the blind will. I should also point out that both Schopenhauer and Freud were influenced by Hindu philosophy, more specifically the concept of Maya, which is very complex, but simply put, it means that the world we believe in is nothing but an illusion or a mask we put on as we go through the cycle of reincarnation. Atman or Brahman, on the other hand, is the unchanging reality or the true self which can only be understood through vigorous meditation and conscious understanding. In Hinduism, Maya is the perceived reality. Atman or Brahman is the true reality which is also the conscious reality. Schopenhauer called the true reality will and the perception of this will as representation. In other words, we know the reality is often an illusion and the truth lies somewhere deeper, only revealed to us through active digging, i.e. meditation or being conscious in the present. Freud as a clinician came across patients who suffer from hysteria. 
He quickly learned that when patients were asked to describe their fantasies or hallucinations, the mere act of expressing those thoughts alleviated them from the illness. He concluded that many mental illnesses such as anxiety, phobia, hysteria, paranoia were caused by a bad experience in the past that were stored in the unconscious. Instead of forgetting those traumas, the patients must have kept them somewhere in their unconscious memory. In other words, our experience do not go away but stay with us, often hidden from our conscious mind. It was not external forces such as God or destiny that drove the human mind to madness, but it was all internal. It was here that Freud understood the power as well as the scope of unconscious mind in our conscious life. The conscious mind is just a tiny part of our psyche. There's a whole new world that sits beneath the conscious mind and makes some of our decisions and determines some of our experiences. Just like an iceberg, consciousness is just the tip and always at the mercy of what's hidden. However, it's somewhat dynamic process between conscious, pre-conscious and unconscious. Just like an iceberg that floats, it reveals different parts at different times. While science and technology were making the lives of Europeans more comfortable and predictable, the unconscious mind was the source of all the chaos that a person may experience. In other words, no matter how orderly and safe the outside world is, the unconscious mind is the main source of our psychological problems, often caused by things that happened to us long time ago in our past, in some cases in our ancestral past. The unconscious is also the place where our deepest animalistic urges reside. For example, our instinctive and often unlimited desire for food and sex. As Schopenhauer said, quote, Life swings like a pendulum backward and forward between pain and boredom. In the unconscious mind, according to Freud, there is no freedom of expression, but a lot of repressed memories and suppressed emotions. I should also point out that this is modern condition because in the olden days, people confessed their inner turmoils, guilt or suppressed memories during a church confession or people were much closer to their families and communities so they could confide in those around them. But in big cities like Vienna, where more people were living closer, the emotional distance was much wider. It was far more difficult to confide to anyone. This has not changed. Today, most people live in big cities, yet we feel lonelier than ever. While these conflicts occur down below, on the conscious level, it causes us a lot of pain, suffering, and even grave mental illnesses. Because they find no venue to vent out. It's like living in a flat and you're surrounded by noisy neighbors who constantly find and make noise and there's no escape. At some point, you lose it and you go bang on their doors. Our unconscious runs a titanic battle between opposing forces, your wands hitting brick walls, your urges unanswered, which can cause turmoil. Of course, our rational conscious mind tries to tame the beast, but we are not always successful. When the rational conscious mind gets overwhelmed, we experience mental problems. So how to cope with the problems of the unconscious mind? Freud offered a really unique treatment. It was so simple that it became revolutionary. He didn't invent the wheel. He simply copied a century-old method. For hundreds of years, people went to church to confess their sins. The mere act of talking was enough to alleviate them from the pain of guilt or trauma they were holding inside. The mere act of expression unburdened them from their emotional turmoil. Freud did the same. He opened the church. No. He asked his patients to relax on a comfy chair and talk, which became known as psychotherapy or simply the talking cure. Today, millions of people, mostly in wealthy countries, get their treatment from their therapists. In poor countries, people either cannot afford or perhaps a more reasonable explanation is that life on the outside is harder than the inside. So when you are survival mode, your mind is focused on living another day. Your mind has less time to create problems for you internally. But when we have plenty of food and live comfortable life, the fight moves inside our psyche. Freud noticed that civilization was one of the leading causes of more mental illnesses as it limited individual freedom as an aggressive animal. 
And the wild mental illness is perhaps not on your priority list as you battle elements and wild animals. This became the basis of Michel Foucault's philosophy that madness and civilization go hand in hand. I should also mention that the talking cure was as much about letting it out, but also it was about someone listening to you. Most of us live lonely lives in big cities, so having someone who listens to you, you alone, without you shouting, is incredibly powerful. So your therapist is doing the job of your partner, parents, friends, or colleagues who don't listen to you. So therapy is as much about letting things out as it is about having someone who can lend you their time and listening ears. Of course, in modern time, you have to pay for that service. Freud's proofs. Freud's theory of the unconscious sounds neat, but what evidence did he show that we truly have an unconscious mind? He offered four pieces of evidence. If volcanoes and hot springs are evidence of molten rock beneath the Earth's crust, then there ought to be some evidence for the unconscious mind too. Freud's first evidence of the unconscious mind was mental illnesses experienced by his patients. They were physically healthy, so why should they suffer from these unknown psychological problems? He listened to them describe their mental state and their childhood memories. In other words, they were experiencing hysteria or hallucinations often very randomly. This proved to Freud that there must be an underlying unconscious. Freud's second piece of evidence of the unconscious mind was dreams. We all dream. It's universal among all humans, young, old, men, women, across all cultures. For Freud, dreams are how our unconscious mind is communicating to us about our deeper urges and wishes, often repressed wishes from childhood. Freud's third piece of evidence is our verbal mistakes. He argued that our repressed wishes also come to us through simple verbal mistakes, which we know today as Freud and slip, which is another way to understand the unconscious. Our conscious mind fights to keep certain things at bay, but from time to time, we involuntarily give out what we really desire. For example, instead of saying, I like your books, you might say, I like your boobs, if you're attracted to the woman. I've done it. Finally, Freud also studied expression in general. For example, a lot of novelists write fictional tales, but often don't even sell or don't even show them to anyone. Freud called this an act of catharsis. You express simply because you cannot bring yourself to tell people how you feel. In other words, you're letting out your suppressed emotions in stories. Storytelling or writing is so powerful as a method of catharsis that sometimes it's used to treat mentally ill patients as it allows them to let it out. Catharsis also happens when you read a book or watch a movie as you feel a release when the characters you relate to in the story gets what he or she wants. So novelists and storytellers act as our therapists as they allow us to express what we feel inside but cannot express, either we don't have the words for it or feel socially restricted. Today online comments is one way of such release. Freud's childhood For Freud, childhood memories were the most powerful ones sitting in the unconscious. Why? As we grow up, we have to leave our childish behaviors, feelings, memories behind. But we cannot really leave them behind. Instead, we leave them trapped inside us. We suppress them. A great example is the American novel The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger about an angry young man who refuses to grow up because he sees grown-ups acting fake. Children are very honest. But as they grow up, they are expected to be nice and polite, which means often being fake. So part of this facade of niceness is suppressed expressions, which means most of social situations you cannot be truly yourself. Another element of modern life is the value of predictability. From trains to work hours, everything is meant to be predictable like a machine. Yet the unconscious is often volatile, chaotic and restless. 
our conscious mind has to reconcile the inner turmoil with the predictable outside world. It's like taming a wild beast to behave in a world run like a factory. This struggle takes a huge mental toll as our conscious and rational mind try to calm or suppress our unconscious, a pool of urges and chaos. Hence, more and more people break down under the weight of modern demand to keep a tap on their emotions. For millions of years, we have evolved animals that roam the wild and now live in urban boxes. While most of us can adopt to this life, some cannot. To sum up, Sigmund Freud drew on philosophers such as Schopenhauer, Nietzsche and other psychologists as well as Hindu philosophy to understand that beneath the rational conscious mind lies a much powerful unconscious. He observed patients suffering from hysteria and other mental illnesses and allowed his patients to talk about their deep desires and fantasies. To understand the unconscious, he also studied dreams as well as slips of the tongue to reveal the hidden urges we suppress in our unconscious. While Freud understood the power of society and civilization on the individual, he mainly focused on the individual psychology, his or her own unconscious, his or her own suppressed memories, his or her own suppressed emotions, his or her own childhood. As a result, he neglected the group, society or the collective side of our consciousness. Here comes another giant of psychoanalysis, Carl Jung, who built on Freud's individual center psychology with a more collectivistic psychology. Carl Jung was born in 1875 and died in 1961. He was a Swiss psychologist who became very close to Sigmund Freud, but later they parted ways after some disagreements. While Freud was interested in the individual, what went on their subconscious, their childhood and their inner struggles, Jung looked outside. He was interested in the commonalities that we all have despite our cultural or religious differences. In other words, there are certain similar myths and symbols that all humans share irrespective of their cultural backgrounds. While your own childhood experiences are stored in your own individual memory, the common myths and symbols are stored in what he termed as the collective memory as part of the collective unconsciousness. These collective memories are not the result of your own individual experiences but inherited from our distant ancestors, passed down to us from generation to generation. Despite slight variations, these myths and symbols are more or less the same in all cultures. In other words, a large part of our psyche or conscious mind is filled by the memories of our ancient ancestors, just like some software. While each individual hardware is different, but we often share the same software. To really understand Jung's theory, we can look at it through philosophy. The Greek philosopher Plato thought everything that exists in the physical world are mere shadows of the form that only exists in the mind. The mind is primary and outside world is mere shadow of that mind. Later in the 17th and 18th centuries in Europe, rationalists believed that humans have an innate knowledge of the world. As babies grow up, this innate knowledge simply unfolds itself so that we make sense of the world. Carl Jung's theory of the collective unconscious is somewhat similar. We have inherited most of our unconscious memories and archetypes from our ancestors. As we grow up, we simply unfold those memories to make sense of our personal experiences and build a persona of our own in the world. In other words, most of our psychology is given to us at birth. As we grow up, that psychology merely unravels itself in our unconscious to guide us through life. For better or worse, the inherited psyche or the collective unconscious manifested in myths and symbols determines a lot of our beliefs, experiences and emotions. Jung called these symbols and myths as archetypes that are molded inside us prior to our birth. In other words, archetypes are like templates or windows for us to understand our own experiences in life. But interestingly, we are not aware that they are given to us. In other words, we are not conscious of these archetypes. We often think of them as somewhat naturally our own, 
just as your genes are passed down to you through your ancestors, these memories are passed down through cultural archetypes. If your DNA is the memory of your genes, the archetypes are your collective cultural memories. You could make a connection between Jung's archetypes and Richard Dawkins' theory of memes. Just as genes spread through offspring, memes spread in the same way. So not only do we have a genetic memory of our past ancestors, we also possess the unconscious collective memories of the early humans. To fully understand Jung, let's go back to philosophy. In the 18th century, Immanuel Kant argued that our knowledge of the world comes through our experiences. But not only that, we have an innate mechanism of rationality that puts a structure onto the world. In other words, we are not passive receivers of knowledge from the outside, we impose our own mental structure on the world. Jung's archetypes are somewhat similar in that through these archetypes and our collective memory, we make better sense of the experiences in the world. Archetypes sit in our unconscious mind to give us patterns so our experiences and emotions appear meaningful to us. In the same way we have the capacity to learn a language, we also come pre-assembled with the capacity to relate to archetypes and stories which ensures our survival within a group in a similar fashion as our physical features like eyes, ears, nose allow us to make sense of the physical world. Our capacity for storytelling allows us to navigate society and culture. Just like Freud, Jung also belonged to the structural school of psychology, so he saw consciousness or the human psyche as a structure divided into three parts the ego, the personal unconscious, and the collective unconscious. The ego is the rational or conscious side of our psyche that regulates our daily lives. It's like a control mechanism, like steering wheel in a car. The personal unconscious, which Freud mainly focused on, includes our own individual memories, including repressed memories and suppressed emotions from our childhood. The collective unconscious, which Jung mainly focused on, is where the archetypes we have inherited from our ancestors are stored. Just as Freud provided dreams as evidence of the existence of the unconscious, Jung too used dreams as evidence of the collective unconscious. In other words, our dreams are like windows into our past collective memories, be it in early humans or even apes who lived in trees or even farther in the past. But Jung's most sophisticated evidence or his most important contribution to psychology didn't come from material science or lab science, but from storytelling or literature. Window to the Collective Unconscious While Freud looked at mental illnesses, dreams, verbal mistakes, and cathartic expression as evidence of the unconscious mind, what was Jung's evidence for the collective unconsciousness? In other words, how did he know we are wired to relate to archetypes? Jung looked at one activity that we all humans share, storytelling. From a very early age, children are mesmerized by stories and even in adulthood we love stories. Why? Because stories not only teach us, they also have a deep emotional impact on us. Stories teach us about the world through other people's mistakes and triumphs, but they also emotionally bond us with others. Just as we bond over food, we also bond over stories. The first time we meet people, we are desperate to know who they are and what their story is. In fact, you could argue that most religions establish themselves through stories, at the heart of which is the story of creation and heaven and hell. Even in the age of science, we humans crave for science to explain to us the story of our origin through scientific evidence. Most tribes, communities, societies, even empires were built upon stories and myths. Without a common myth, it's hard to unite an empire or a community. In fact, we humans crave for a meaning in our lives. How do you find meaning? Through the stories we tell ourselves. Every morning we wake up and go to work because we believe in a story that our life is moving somewhere. Depression or anxiety result when we lose faith in our life's story. So, our life's meaning is closely tied to the stories we tell ourselves. Some believe in religions, some in success, some in love, some in social justice. These are all stories that give people's lives meanings. 
Nations are built on stories. Patriotism or nationalism is a story in which people inside the country believe in that country being the best or better than other ones, or people often talk of morale among soldiers. It simply means they are losing faith in the story told to them. So story and belief are closely tied like conjoined twins. Great storytellers and filmmakers are the ones who tell believable stories that are convincing. Jung found that storytelling is where archetypes live. In other words, archetypes are common and recurring characters in all stories. Some of the examples Jung gives us are the wise old man, the wise old woman, the hero, the father, the mother, the devil, and so forth. If you look at myths and stories, you can find many of these archetypes throughout the world. Jung even called the masculine and feminine as archetypes, which he called animus and anima. We are born with both masculine and feminine traits, so as we grow, we grow into an archetype depending on our sex. The strong masculine man is craved by females and the soft feminine woman craved by males. In other words, these are refined characters through the river of history. Just as pebbles are refined by running water over the years and centuries and millennia, these archetypes are refined characters through a thousand years of human evolution. So these archetypes are not the results of our conscious mind, but the collective unconscious. If a woman loves to read about a strong masculine man, like in Fifty Shades of Grey, not because it's a Western concept, but it is because females on the unconscious level are hardwired to seek such archetypes as a mate. In the same way, the male psychology craves a feminine woman. Why archetypes? Now you might ask why these archetypes came about. The simple answer is in our evolutionary biology, as a living organism or animal, we face predators and prey. We face survival challenges. How we behave when faced with these survival challenges define our archetypes. So archetypes are wired into our DNA because they allowed us to survive and pass on those genes to others. Archetypes are our survival instincts written in stories. The same rule applies to stories themselves. Only stories that have resonated with most humans have survived through centuries. As Italo Calvino said, folk tales or legends are told and retold that they have become smooth like pebbles by the time they arrive to us. In other words, the longer a story or myth survives, the more bare-born or their essential elements remain. So one can say that these archetypes are the essential characters in the survival of our species as they guide each generation to survive, thrive, and successfully reproduce. Not only do these archetypes guide us in life to make sense of our own experiences, they also play a role in our personality. In fact, we unconsciously use the archetypes to display a persona of our own to the world. When we present ourselves to others, we are careful to show some bits and hide other bits. Not only that, we are also selective about what to show depending on where we are. We might take a different persona in the presence of a beautiful woman who we are romantically interested in. But in the presence of our family members or friends, we put out a different persona altogether. The same when we go to a job interview, we present our stronger side. The Japanese have a concept called hone and tatemai. Hone means your true self and the one you show inside your own house. Tatemai is a persona you show to others or a social facade. They are vastly different. Jung calls this public self or archetype the persona. But there's also the part that we don't want the world to know. Jung calls it the shadow, which is the opposite of the persona. It sits in the dark and we do everything to hide it from others. These are our secrets and suppressed urges or thoughts. In storytelling, it's the villain. In the religions, the devil. We tend to associate the shadow with others and rarely with ourselves. The bad guys are always someone else and rarely ourselves. For example, throughout history and all warfare, both sides call the other side as the bad guys or villains or evils. Amid all these archetypes, Jung argued that our life's ultimate goal is to realize the true self, which is the most important archetype. Martin Heidegger called it authenticity. 
which he argued can be achieved if we truly understand and accept death as a necessary condition of life. For Jung, finding the true self needs a lot of work, just like in Hinduism, it can only be achieved through consciously seeking it. Jung says, by understanding the unconscious, we free ourselves from its domination. So to sum up, while Freud argued that the unconscious, which includes collected memories, trauma, suppressed emotions from our childhood, determine most of our behavior and experiences in life, Jung went a step further saying that it's not just our own individual unconscious memories, but also the collective unconscious memories we inherit from our ancestors. So the unconscious is not just our own, but also those who came before us. Just as Freud and Jung were active before the Second World War, the landscape changed quite a bit after the war, with the invention of crucial piece of technology. In fact, this technology was invented precisely to be used in the war to break the German intelligence. It was a computer. With computers came rationality and cognitive ability. So far, I have discussed psychological schools and approaches and trying to understand the human mind. But in the next segment, I'll look at the solutions to psychological problems. Two distinctive approaches emerged as a way to combat psychological problems. In the German-speaking world, psychotherapy emerged as a talking cure and cathartic expressions. In the Anglo-Saxon world, cognitive psychology emerged as a way to make people more empowered through intellectual stimulation. So in the next segment, I'll discuss psychotherapy and in the following segment, I'll talk about cognitive psychology or cognitive psychotherapy. Six, psychotherapy, how to cure modern suffering. Previously, I discussed Freud and Jung who focused on the unconscious. While Freud took an individualistic approach to the person's own unconscious developed in their own lifetime, Jung took a more collective approach to the unconscious developed in our lifetime, but also inherited from thousands of years of evolutionary wiring. While both Freud and Jung try to explain the unconscious mind, in this segment I'll talk about a few approaches to psychotherapy or how to solve psychological problems or how to cure the suffering of the mind. Three distinct approaches emerged in how to cure modern psychological illness. Gestalt psychotherapy took a more masculine approach by emphasizing rationality, therefore putting the responsibility on each individual to grow up and take accountability. In other words, it's better to be cruel than to be kind. Humanistic psychotherapy, on the other hand, took a more softer feminine approach by emphasizing human needs for fulfillment in a lonely and disconnected world. A third approach called existential psychotherapy, which emerged from literature and storytelling, emphasized life's purpose and meaning as an antidote to modern suffering. Before I explain different schools of psychotherapy, I should give you a brief philosophical context. One of the most fundamental questions that has puzzled philosophers and psychologists has been the problem of perception. How do we know reality? How do we get knowledge of the world? So before we can cure modern suffering, we ought to know what causes this suffering. So perception is at the heart of suffering. For thousands of years, philosophers believed that knowledge is innate in us, most likely given by God or gods. However, in the 17th and 18th centuries, two opposing philosophical approaches emerged in Europe. On the one hand, rationalism argues we have an innate knowledge of the world. It is given to us at birth. The outside world just helps us or triggers us to unfold this innate knowledge. Why innate? Well, it's God-given, or you could say it's a new DNA. The British philosophers such as John Locke and David Hume didn't buy this rationalist explanation. Instead, they argued that our knowledge comes from outside. As babies, we know nothing. As we grow up, we learn things through our senses and slowly we build a more sophisticated understanding of the world and ourselves. So rationalists think knowledge is innate and empiricists think knowledge comes from our experiences with the outside world. Then the German philosopher Immanuel Kant came to bring these two schools together. He argued that neither rationalism nor empiricism has the full answer. The real answer is somewhere in the middle. 
First, Kant argued that we can never fully know the world, so our knowledge is always partial, biased, and limited. Why? Because we are not sponges that absorbs everything, rather we are extremely picky and selective in our understanding of the world. Our knowledge of the world comes from outside, but we are not passive, rather we are extremely selective in receiving the knowledge. He argued that we humans in fact impose our own structure to the world, so our knowledge comes to us organized, categorized and easy to understand. How do we do it? He said we have an innate mental structure that we impose onto the outside world. However, despite Kant's reconciliation of empiricism and rationalism, science in general favored empiricism and it was more evidence-based. The empirical approach broke things down into smaller parts so we can analyze them separately. This approach gives science the ability to study matter in its smaller parts like atoms, cells, particles, and so forth. So in Germany in 1880s, when Wundt opened his lab at the University of Leipzig, he was a scientist and naturally he explained the psyche through empirical experiments. He studied the mind as a structure that can be broken down into smaller parts. Thus, his psychology is termed as a structuralist approach, which is very much an empiricist approach to the human psyche. So, a structuralism and psychology saw the human mind as a structure that can be broken down into smaller parts and each part can be studied separately. Wundt, for example, studied humans' reaction to certain triggers and thus divided human consciousness into three parts representation, willingness, and feeling. The next generation of German-speaking psychologists responded to structuralism by arguing that it is a mistake to look at the mind as a structure. One of the first psychological approaches that questioned structuralism was Gestalt psychology. Gestalt psychology, we are rational, responsible individuals. Gestalt in German means form or pattern, so instead of looking at the mind as a structure that can be broken down into smaller components, like one studies living organisms as atoms or cells, Gestalt psychology looks at the mind as a whole. Therefore, it's a holistic approach much closer to Kant's rationalist philosophy as well as Plato's idealism. But who are Gestalt psychologists? Fritz Perls, who lived between 1893 and 1970, a German-born psychologist, agreed with Kant that we see reality through a human lens or a funnel. Therefore, our perception of reality is not the entire reality but a limited perspective of reality. For example, when we see, smell, hear or touch something, we only get a partial understanding of what that thing really is. As Kant said, we can never fully know the real world as it is, but only know the phenomenal world as we see and experience it. So Fritz Perls, alongside his wife, Laura Perls, focused on the perception itself, not the object of perception. According to structuralism, you can study consciousness through the, its reaction to the outside world events. You can trigger someone through sounds, lights, as William Wundt carried out his experiments. Pearls, however, argued that perception cannot be broken down. Our knowledge of reality is highly subjective depending on factors such as proximity, similarity, prior exposure, connection between objects, and change. As a result, studying perception or consciousness should not be based on some unified or rigid structure that can be fully understood. Instead, it's very much changeable and we each have a somewhat control on how we perceive things. In other words, we are responsible for how we see the world. We cannot hide behind the blind will or unconscious mind controlling us. At the end of the day, we are free to see the world. I should also point out that Fritz Perls was of Jewish descent, therefore he lived when Nazism took over Germany and had to flee. At the time, many Germans saw no problem with Nazism and later some people blamed their actions on following orders. Today, a lot of people blame society or the system for their behaviors or mistakes. So, Fritz Perls wanted accountability for our actions. Perls also had an issue with psychoanalysis, which argued that most of our behaviors were the result of the unconscious mind. This means we cannot be held responsible for a lot of what we do because we do them unconsciously. 
But putting the blame squarely on the unconscious mind also had another danger. It meant that patients had to be rescued for the unconscious hell. Who could rescue them? Of course, psychotherapists. This gave the psychotherapists an immense power over their patients. So Fred's Pearls wanted autonomy and responsibility, which became the foundation of Gestalt psychology. Gestalt psychology emphasizes personal autonomy and control over our perception, actions, and emotions. For example, you are capable to learn how to understand the world, either follow others or carve a path for yourself. You are also responsible for your actions. Not only that, you are also responsible for how you feel. In other words, nobody can make you feel angry, only you can. If something doesn't go your way, you have a choice, either find a solution or get angry or cry about it. You can't blame the world for how you feel. To understand Pearl's idea, it's helpful to compare it to the Buddhist doctrine of conscious living in now and here and the impermanence of things. We are responsible to be aware of ourselves and the world but also aware that everything is constantly changing, just as your feelings are changing. So it's your job to be aware of an ever-changing world. Gestalt is a very individualistic approach that gives the individual full autonomy and responsibility, so one cannot blame the world, the unconscious, fate or anything. You can only blame yourself. Nobody can victimize you but yourself. Everything is a choice. Gestalt psychology is a very masculine approach to life, which Guy Carnot, who was born in 1951, further emphasized the role of a strong masculine father as a role model for a strong, robust children. The absence of a strong father leads to soft children. This idea is beautifully depicted in one of the most profound Russian novels written in 1859. Oblomov by Ivan Goncharov is about the laziest character in literature who refuses to get out of bed for his entire adult life. Now, interestingly, his friend is a total opposite, a disciplined, responsible, hard-working man. Why is that? The lazy man has a Russian father while his hard-working friend has a German father. Goncharov, of course, pokes fun at Russian society compared to how hard-working the Germans are. So Gestalt psychology emerged from that German psyche of hard work and responsibility. Gestalt psychology had a huge influence in the field of empowering the individuals. You make or break your own fate. Nobody can help you if you cannot help yourself. Some criticize it for being a bit cold and less cozy for not relying on others. Being in the presence of people who take care of you can also be extremely important for one's mental well-being, which according to Gestalt might make you too soft. So to sum up, Pearls pioneered Gestalt psychology by arguing that how we perceive reality is far more important than the reality itself. It's not what you see but rather how you see. Is your cup half empty or half full? Do you take responsibility or do you blame others? He also emphasized that individuals take responsibility for their thoughts, actions, and feelings. Nobody can force you to think, act, or feel the way you do except yourself. Reason meets emotions. While Gestalt psychology takes a very rational approach to human psychology, therefore it neglects the human emotions that often overpower our rational thought. It's all good and well to be rational all the time, but when we get emotional, which we often do, rationality is thrown out of the window and we throw a tantrum like babies. So how do we rationally explain and understand and tame emotions? This task of reconciling rationality with emotion fell to the American psychologist Albert Ellis. Albert Ellis, who was born in 1913 and died in 2007, developed a psychological theory that is somewhat similar to Gestalt arguing that experiences do not cause emotional reaction in us, but our belief system does. His theory is called Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy. He argued that our irrational thoughts cause us emotional issues. We often call some people overthinkers, anxious, or neurotic. If two people lose their jobs, an overthinker who suffers from irrational beliefs may find it a lot harder to deal with it, while the rational thinker might look for a solution by simply trying to find another job. 
or one blames other for his misfortune, while the other may blame themselves or nobody instead focuses on finding the answer. Ellis says, the best years of your life are the ones in which you decide your problems are your own. You realize that you control your own destiny. Rational thinkers accept reality and try to find new ways to adapt to it, rather than wishing reality was different. So how we emotionally respond to a difficult experience has a lot to do with ourselves, our belief system, and less so with the outside world. If someone jumps in the queue in front of you, you have a choice how you react. Get angry, simply accept, or calmly tell the person. The irrational response would be anger. The rational response would be either acceptance or tell the person to move back if there is no danger in doing so. So how we think for the most part affects how we feel. Religious ascetics are often very humble. They rarely get angry or emotional. Why? Because they are very strong in their beliefs. They have a firm anchor that nothing can sway them. So our belief has a lot to do with how we feel when faced at problems of life. The idea that your belief can impact your behavior can be seen through what's called the placebo effect, when patients are given medication and they get better, perhaps because they believe that the medicine would cure them. Dr. Bruce Lipton, in his 2005 book titled The Biology of Belief, Unleashing the Power of Consciousness, Matter and Miracles, goes so far as to claim that our beliefs impact our DNA rather than the other way around. The science of epigenetics suggests that our beliefs have influence over our genes, especially in the protein culture. As I discussed earlier while talking about Carl Jung's theory of the collective unconsciousness, that our beliefs are closely tied to our stories. The better stories we can tell ourselves, the stronger our core beliefs become. There is also a claim that certain diseases are more prevalent in certain cultures due to their cultural beliefs. The mainstream science, however, holds that we inherit most of our biology from our DNA. Ellis also observed that irrational thoughts tend to be black and white, fixed and absolute, while rational thoughts tend to change depending on the environment. So to sum up, Ellis argued that our emotional reactions to an external event is tied to our irrational beliefs which holds us back. While Gestalt psychology and psychotherapy emphasize rationality and accountability, which is a very masculine and immature approach, for some psychologists, reason alone couldn't solve our modern suffering. No matter how rational we are, our anxiety and suffering can only be cured through fulfillment and meaning. So here come humanistic psychotherapy and existential psychotherapy. Humanistic psychology, social justice and love. While Gestalt and rational emotive psychology focused on the rationalistic side of the human psyche, i.e. individualism as it promoted autonomy and responsibility, some psychologists on the left felt this was a bit too individual-centered, even selfish in essence. And also this was very Western, but there was also a more Eastern philosophy-influenced approach that focused more on fulfillment and self-actualization. So this new psychological approach took a more humanistic approach, which was more communitarian and less individualistic, less rigidly rational but more humane and softer approach that saw life as a spiritual journey of fulfillment. One of the earliest humanistic psychologists was Eric Fromm, who united Marxist social justice with Freudian unconscious mind. Fromm was born in 1900 and died in 1980, he was a German psychologist who combined Marx's philosophy with Freud's psychoanalysis to develop what is called humanistic psychology. Karl Marx, influenced by European humanism, developed a socialist philosophy in which inequality was seen as the root cause of human pain. Freud, influenced by Hindu philosophy, thought that most of our life's suffering is caused not by economic inequality, but by the unconscious. Fromm agreed with both that life for the most part is full of physical pain and emotional suffering. Why? Fromm took a communitarian approach and argued that our suffering is caused by our separation anxiety. 
As humans, we first became separate from nature when we developed rational thoughts. We saw ourselves to be different from other animals. This made the human species the loneliest species on the planet because we were the only species who had this sophisticated language, culture, and built empires that ran for generations, all thanks to our ability to have rational thoughts. So, to cope with the anxiety caused by our separation from nature, we relied on our families, tribes, communities, and religions. And of course, God. However, with the arrival of modernity, those communal bonds slowly crumbled. So modernity caused our second separation anxiety. Modernity gave us a lot of choices as well as freedom from religion, dogma, tradition, and even family. However, this freedom, instead of making us happy, caused us more loneliness. Just as Soren Kierkegaard said, our anxiety is the dizziness of freedom. So what's the answer? From offers love as the best antidote to suffering. Just like the Persian Sufi poet Rumi, love is the only path that unites us with others. The theme of love as the greatest antidote to suffering is also present in the works of the Russian novelist Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky saw love as the only way we can truly be fulfilled. Rumi's love is more mystical and divine, Dostoevsky's love is more orthodox Christian, as well as the simplicity of life seen through the eyes of the Russian peasants. Fromm's love is different. It's not the love of someone or something, but it is a creative capacity to encompass the whole world. In other words, through love, we reconnect with nature as well as other people through creative freedom. A good example is art and artistic creativity. Creative artists capture people's imagination through their art. Why? Because they cultivate the capacity to reunite with nature. Just like Nietzsche, Fromm saw art as an avenue to see the world in new, interesting ways. While many artists lack the ability to love or be loved by those around them, yet they cultivate a greater capacity to create art that is loved by many people. So to sum up, from saw modern anxiety caused by our separation from nature and community. As a result, the antidote to suffering is return to nature through creative endeavors that have love at its heart. Another psychologist who took a humanistic approach was the American psychologist Carl Rogers. While Fromm placed suffering in our separation anxiety of our love as an antidote, Rogers argued we suffer because we are too rigid in our views, so we ought to be more flexible to change. Carl Rogers, who was born in 1902 and died in 1987, saw mental illnesses or mental health not as something static that was fixed, but as a process that was ongoing. In other words, not a stationary being, but more dynamically moving or becoming like a shifting target. As Nietzsche said, we are not human beings, but human becomings, as we go through changes and transformation throughout our lives. Rogers says, quote, What I'll be in the next moment and what I'll do grows out of the moment and cannot be predicted. For Rogers, even our personalities develop through our daily experiences. It may seem solid, but it's never solidified. In fact, he argues that a good life is only achieved through our openness to new experiences, ideas, and emotions, as well as accepting to trust ourselves. It's only in rigidity that we develop mental illnesses because we either bury hatred, resentment inside, or show them on the outside. Rigidity makes it difficult for us to accept reality as it is. Instead, we want the reality to conform to our wishes. This causes frustration, anxiety. And if challenged enough, it causes mental illness. He also demanded that we take responsibility for our lives. This accountability also makes our lives easier as we know what to do instead of blaming the world. You cannot change the world, but you can certainly change yourself. One can see the influence of Eastern philosophy in Roger's psychology. In Eastern philosophy, instead of changing the world or environment, the responsibility is put on the individual to change themselves to adapt better in any environment. This humanistic and person-centered approach was taken up by another famous American psychologist, 
Abraham Maslow, who was also influenced by the Indian philosophy of self-actualization and fulfillment in life. Abraham Maslow, who was born in 1908 and died in 1970, whose hierarchy of needs is a well-known list of human motivation and the process of self-actualization. Maslow was interested to know how we find meaning and fulfillment in life, what motivates us to wake up every morning, go to work and repeat the same until we retire or die. Maslow understood that humans achieve different states of consciousness depending on their needs. He divided into two main sections and each of those into separate four parts. The first section he called deficiency needs. As a living organism, our basic needs are air, food, water, sleep, warmth, and exercise. But we also need to be safe, be in the company of others, and get recognition from others. So our basic needs are mere survival. The second section he called growth needs, which includes cognitive, aesthetic, self-actualization, and finally self-transcendence. In other words, we need to know the world, appreciate its beauty, showcase our personal potential, and finally become greater than ourselves by helping others. This is somewhat similar to the Eastern philosophy of achieving a higher level of consciousness that gives you fulfillment. Of course, in Hinduism and Buddhism, nirvana is the escape from the cycle of birth and rebirth. But Maslow's hierarchy of needs is achievable in this world. So both Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow took a humanistic approach in which meaning and fulfillment were at the forefront of human existence. While Gestalt focused on individual responsibility, therefore more outcome-driven and success-based, humanistic psychology, however, took a softer approach, influenced by Eastern philosophy in which one must feel fulfilled. This humanistic approach also hinted at another approach which is called existentialist psychology. Existential psychology Existentialism in philosophy came about after the death of God. It has its origin in literature in which the characters or heroes are thrown into difficult situations in order for them to struggle and come out triumphant. As a philosophy, existentialism argues that we are born first and then we can define who we are. According to Jean-Paul Sartre, perhaps the most influential existentialist philosopher, existence precedes essence, which means we have no essence at birth. And as we grow and mature, we are able to define ourselves. No God has given us a purpose in life. It's up to each individual to define a purpose for himself and herself. And psychology, existential psychotherapy is very similar to humanistic psychotherapy in that both emphasizes free will and self-actualization. It's up to each individual to find a purpose in life. While humanistic psychotherapy tries to alleviate suffering, existential psychotherapy says we can cope with suffering if we have meaning for our lives. Two of the most famous existential psychologists were Viktor Frankl and Rollo May. Viktor Frankl, born in 1905, died in 97, was a German psychologist whose three years of horrific experience in the Nazi concentration camp had a lasting impact on him. He developed an existential psychotherapy in which meaning was the most important element in someone's life. His famous book, Man's Search for Meaning, published in 1946, details two important human qualities that endure hardship decision-making capacity, and freedom. He argued that if someone has a solid meaning for their life, they can endure any hardship. In other words, if you have a solid story for your life, you can overcome any challenge. A story gives you purpose and therefore it anchors you. He treated patients who are suffering from grief by trying to find meaning for their suffering. He says, quote, Suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds meaning. But how do you find meaning? Frankl argued that meaning is not created but discovered. We discover through work, through creativity, and through loving others. Rollo May, who was born in 1909 and died in 1994, was another existential psychologist who wrote an influential book, the Meaning of Anxiety in 1950. 
in which he drew upon philosophers such as Soren Kierkegaard, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Martin Heidegger to argue that instead of categorizing life's experiences as good or bad, we should follow the Buddhist view that all human experiences should be accepted equally. Why? Because once we accept all experiences as equally important in our lives, we open the door to growth. Everything we do during the day are significant in the overall story. Just as every brick is important in holding a building stable, so is every little thing we do. Once we recognize that all of our actions are important, we also accept that negative feelings are as important as positive ones in our lives. So to conclude this segment, in psychotherapy two distinct approaches emerged. Gestalt has a distinctly Western individualistic approach, while humanistic existential has an Eastern flavor. Gestalt emphasizes rationality, while humanistic and existential psychotherapy emphasizes meaning. Gestalt psychology grew in response to structuralism and psychoanalysis, to put the responsibility on the individual rather than the outside events or the internal unconscious. Fritz Perls demanded that individuals take accountability for their thoughts, actions, and emotions. Albert Ellis echoed this in his rational emotive psychology in which he emphasized that our irrational beliefs often cause us emotional suffering and even physical pain. Instead, we should react to outside events rationally. Eric Fromm developed what is termed humanistic psychotherapy in which he argued that our anxiety is because of our separation from nature and other people. So he emphasized we developed our creative capacity for love that can reconnect us with nature as well as other people. Carl Rogers also took a humanistic approach to mental illness, not as something static but rather changeable and impermanent, just like the Buddhist notion of the world. Rogers emphasized openness to new ideas, experiences, and feelings, also living in the here and now. Maslow further developed the humanistic psychology in terms of human needs in his famous hierarchy of needs chart, in which a human journeys through life from meeting his own survival needs to achieving transcendence by helping others. And finally, Viktor Frankl and Rollo May developed existential psychotherapy arguing that meaning allows us to cope with life's suffering. Instead of avoiding suffering, we come to terms with it once we understand the meaning behind it. Of course, the two world wars devastated Europe so people felt lost, so these psychologists tried to find answers. Gestalt, which takes a more Western rational individualistic approach, asks people to take responsibility for their actions and not blame others. Humanistic psychology took a more communitarian approach that focused more on the meaning and fulfillment and less on productivity and success. And finally, existential psychotherapy argues that if you have meaning, you can cope with any suffering or challenges life throws at you. However, computers were invented during the Second World War in order to break into the German intelligence. So in the next segment, I'll talk about cognitive psychology in which the mind meets the computer. Unlike behaviorism and psychoanalysis, cognitive psychology tried to explain human perception, memory, and the power of intelligence. Yes, we are conditioned by our environment, and yes, we are prisoners of our unconscious mind, but despite all these limitations, we are also capable of becoming more intelligent and more aware. In other words, the mind is not a hindrance, but one of the most sophisticated computational machines out there. Seven, cognitive psychology, mind versus computer. In the previous segment, I discussed psychotherapy, starting with Gestalt approach that put the responsibility on the rational individual and humanist psychotherapy focused on fulfillment while existential psychotherapy emphasized meaning. In this segment, first I'll discuss cognitive psychology that emerged after the Second World War, in which the focus shifted from behavior to perception and memory and how the mind works especially in the light of the invention of computers. Cognitive psychology saw the limitations of behaviorism as well as psychoanalysis. Behaviorism focused on learning, but it failed to adequately explain perception and memory, but most crucially it failed to explain intelligence. 
While psychoanalysis focused on the subconscious or unconscious, it too failed to fully explain why some people like Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung were able to have such insight with others did not. How is it possible for minds such as Alan Turing to invent the computer that broke the German Enigma code? While behaviorism and psychoanalysis saw a uniformity in standard among individuals and that they all behave in the same way under certain conditions, we all have the same unconscious mind, but they fail to understand the differences in our cognitive abilities. One of the biggest problems with both behaviorism and psychoanalysis was that they made the individual somewhat powerless in the face of their environmental conditioning or the unconscious beast. So cognitive psychology emerged to tell us that the human mind is one of the most sophisticated and powerful machines out there. Instead of hindering us, our mind is immensely empowering. To fully understand cognitive psychology, let's discuss its sociocultural context. One of the characteristics of the modern condition is the prevalence of machines dominating society and determining our lives. This is beautifully depicted in the novels of Franz Kafka, such as The Trial and The Metamorphosis, in which the individual feel paralyzed under the weight of modern bureaucracy. While novelists such as Kafka and Aldous Huxley warned about machines sucking out our humanity, psychologists, instead of pushing back against technology, try to use science to align humans with machines. So a new school of psychology was born. Cognitive psychology tries to look at the human brain in the light of advancement in the machine and especially computers to understand how to empower individuals rather than complain. Cognitive psychology has its origin in Gestalt psychology. As I discussed before, Gestalt psychology focused on perception and how the mind organizes perception, but most crucially, rationality is the best tool we have. As a result, cognitive psychology expanded on our perception, how it becomes memory, and how memory in turn influences perception. Therefore, we are able to utilize it to improve our lives. In short, cognitive psychology wanted to understand the connection among attention, memory, and intelligence. Before I go any further, let me define a few important terms used in cognitive psychology. The main focus of cognitive psychology is the perception and memory. When we deal with the outside world or even our own internal experiences like feelings and imaginations, we have tools to perceive information like our sensory system. Philosophers, especially those who came after Kant, argued that we cannot fully know reality, but we only have partial perception of reality. So what is perception? Simply put, perception is sensory signals we receive through our bodily senses, such as sight, hearing, smell, touch, and taste. Perception also includes how the mind interprets those signals. Our senses perceive information from the outside as well as from inside but we are not fully aware of most of the sensory data we receive. What we are aware of is called attention, which is a more focused perception. So perception includes all sensory signals, while attention is what we are aware of. Also interesting to note that cognitive psychology is primarily interested in attention and memory, so that individuals can utilize them for more creativity and productivity. How about memory? As we receive sensory data, we are only attentive to some of it, and most of it ends up in our memory. But there are two kinds of memories, short-term memory and long-term memory. Short-term memory, which is also known as working memory, is accessible to us immediately, while long-term memory tends to be buried in our deeper consciousness, like the unconscious, but also influences our behavior in ways we are not aware of. So short-term memory is somewhat similar to random access memory or RAM in a computer that deals with the ongoing tasks. Long-term memory, on the other hand, is somewhat similar to hard disk storage in that everything that is not needed right now goes in there for future access. While we can choose what to put in in our computer hard drive, we have no conscious choice when it comes to our own long-term memory. We cannot delete it. Therefore, good or bad memories stay with us. As I discussed earlier, Freud and Jung argued that those memories stay in our unconscious that from time to time come back to haunt us when triggered. 
or on a positive side, they become involuntary memories that transport us into our past as it was depicted in Marcel Proust's novel In Search of Lost Time. Now that we established working definitions for perception, memory and attention, let's talk about some of the leading cognitive psychologists. First I'll look at psychological studies of perception, then move on to discuss memory and finally I'll deal with cognitive therapy as a solution to our cognitive issues in the modern world, which is how to take control of the mind to enhance our lives. Perception Wolfgang Kohler, who lived between 1887 and 1967, was a German psychologist in the Gestalt branch. He questioned behaviorism as being too simplistic an approach that limited learning to environmental conditioning. Kohler instead argued that learning is a complex and dynamic process and behavior psychology failed to credit intelligence and insight. When animals interact with the environment, they are not passive learners who only take what the condition allows them. Instead, they are also inventors, problem solvers, and insightful learners. By focusing too much on the outside environmental conditions, behavior psychology failed to understand how an animal's mental structure organizes perception. It's neither passive nor one-way street and that everything originates on the outside and animal only reacts, but rather the animal has a robust mind of its own that influences reality to some degree. This is similar to Kant's philosophical argument that we impose our mental structure on the world. While Kohler's argument that humans are insightful learners and proactive in shaping reality, his arguments remain somewhat philosophically abstract. But our next cognitive psychologists made concrete cases for proactive perception and how the human mind is a powerful machine that impacts reality. Leon Feistinger, who was born in 1919 and died in 1989, was a Russian-American psychologist who, also drawn to Gestalt psychology, further cemented the argument that we are not passive absorbers of information but rather we have our own filter. In other words, our mind is very selective in what information to take in and what to ignore. You might ask what this filter is called. Festinger gave the example of our beliefs and convictions in how we see the world. In other words, we have biases, beliefs, convictions that allow us to see the world in a very particular way. We are not objective when it comes to reality. While our bias lens is commonly accepted by many, but how do you scientifically study human convictions shaping reality? Festinger looked at how individuals deal with the contradictions between belief and reality. Festinger coined the term cognitive dissonance, which means that when the evidence contradicts our strong belief, we feel discomfort due to our internal inconsistency. He studied a cult whose leader had received a message from aliens that the world would end on a certain date. However, when it didn't happen, instead of the cult members acknowledging their mistake, they became even more stronger in their conviction and found loopholes to justify their beliefs. This study, Oak Park as it's known, showed that the human animals are not passive to reality or evidence, but rather proactive to change reality or the environment based on their beliefs. In other words, we are not just conditioned by our environmental evidence, but we also condition our environment through our cognitive beliefs. First, we are shaped by reality, but we also shape reality in return. We are agents shaped by change, but we are also agents that bring about change. While Festinger showed that our belief and conviction narrow our perception of reality, it also helps us to create reality in some way. But the question remained as to how our mind decides what external evidence to accept and what evidence to reject. This question was answered by our next cognitive psychologist. Roger Shepard, who was born in 1929 and died in 2022, developed a theory that our mind not only interprets data coming through our sensory organs, but the mind also actively makes conclusions based on its own internal 3D model of the outside world. In other words, there is the outside world, we receive sensory signals, but the mind doesn't just sit still 
instead it tries to make sense of the data but actually rationalizes theories and come up with snappy conclusions. This happens so quickly for us to fully register. Why? The simple answer is pattern recognition. When we eat something delicious like a cherry, our mind quickly registers as a good food we can eat again. So next time we come across cherry, it's easy. This became known as the law of generalization. We are wired to generalize all cherries as delicious. So animals are programmed to recognize patterns and generalize. In his experiment, he showed his subjects optical illusions and the subjects were able to see through the illusion or rotate objects in their mind. Since you cannot fool people with some illusions, he concluded that the mind has an internal map of the external objects. What we perceive in our mind doesn't exist in our mind, but on the outside. But our mind thinks that the internal model is as real as the one on the outside. He famously said that the perception is externally guided hallucination. What we perceive to be real only exists on the outside, yet our mind thinks it does exist on the inside too. Therefore, he called externally guided hallucination. Dreams or actual hallucinations on the other hand are internally stimulated perception, he argued. In other words, when we dream or hallucinate, the thing doesn't exist on the outside, but entirely on the inside. Perception, however, does exist on the outside, but not on the inside. So Shepard concluded that our mind is able to rotate objects in the real world, not physically, but imaginatively, because the mind has a 3D model of the outside world. On a more philosophical level, many philosophers believed that the mind contains everything in the universe, or the universe is an actually a mental reality. For example, Schopenhauer says, all ostensible minds can be attributed to matter, but all matter can likewise be attributed to mind. To sum up, while behaviorists ignore the capability of the human mind to shape reality, Cognitive psychologists such as Kohler, Festinger, and Shepard were able to see our perception as a very active agent in shaping reality. Now let's shift our attention to attention. What is attention and how does it work? Is it a funnel or more like an ocean? Attention. Donald Broadbent, who was born in 1926 and died in 1993, was a British psychologist and active around the same time as Alan Turing, whose computer was instrumental in hacking into the German Enigma machine. While working as a fighter pilot, Broadbent observed that a lot of man-made accidents happen because pilots mistook a lever for one thing for something else when they were bombarded with too much information. Since information overload can overwhelm us, he came to the conclusion that our attention has a limit. So he concluded that the human mind processes information in somewhat similar fashion to a computer. His study, which is known as Dichotic Listening Experiment, was carried out among air traffic controllers, where he noticed that they did the most effective job when they were dealing with one message at a time. This selective attention to a particular voice was somewhat akin to a filtering system in which the subject had to silence other voices to solely focus on one voice at a time. He used a Y-shaped tube as an analogy. When two separate messages enter the bottleneck, the flap only open for one message at a time, which is known as the broadband filter model. For example, when two voices came through at the same time, the brain has to make a snap decision which one should come first. It's all done in the short-term memory stage. Quote, one of the two voices is selected for a response without reference to its correctness and the other is ignored. But how does the mind make that decision as to what message to store first? He argues that filtering depends as much on the content or message of the information as it depends on other factors such as clarity of voice, prior expectations, prior experiences, and memories. In other words, the short-term memory is sometimes open to new information, but most of the time it simply selectively listens to things based on other factors. 
broadband used cocktail party as an analogy in which people hear many voices but only listen to one, not the others. So to sum up, broadband argued that there is a clear limit to our attention and realistically we can only listen to one message at a time. And we choose which message based on the content of the message, but also prior memories or expectations. So just like other cognitive psychologists, he argued that the human mind is an active agent in shaping reality, not a passive agent that only absorbs reality. Our attention is pretty instrumental and proactive in how it selects what to listen and what not to listen. Now that we have established that perception is not one-way street or slave to the outside world, the fact that the mind itself has an intention of its own is very selective, we move on to the second topic of cognitive psychology, which is memory. How does perception turn into memory? Memory. The pioneer of memory studies was Hermann Ebbinghaus, whom I discussed in a previous segment. He tested his own memory by trying to memorize meaningful words and then a bunch of nonsensical syllables. He concluded that our memory favors things that are meaningful to us, as well as how long we expose ourselves to them and how long after we want to retrieve them. So, we remember things that have certain use to us, the longer we spend time dealing with those things and finally how soon we need those things. So unlike a computer, human memory is purpose-driven and time-sensitive. To understand human memory, let's discuss how the human brain makes decisions. As Shakespeare's Hamlet holding a human skull and asking what to remember and what not to remember. Then once it has decided what to remember, how does it do it? Baluma Zaganik, who was born in 1901 and died in 1988, was a Russian psychologist who studied how the brain is biased towards unfinished tasks. When researching, she found that when a task was incomplete due to an interruption, the participants were more likely to remember the task. For example, waiters were more likely to remember customers who hadn't paid than those who had paid. In other words, the memory is biased towards a task that is yet to be completed. The brain forgets the task that is done. This phenomena is now known as Zeganik effect, which means our memory retains more when we have regular breaks. So the brain prioritizes things to be done. This is also called the working memory because the task is not complete and needs our attention. Now that we understand that our memory favors an incomplete task rather than completed tasks, how does it do it? George Miller, who was born in 1920 and died in 2012, was an American psychologist who took up William James' distinction between short-term and long-term memory by focusing on how short-term memory really worked. Incidentally, he also worked at MIT with Noam Chomsky whose theory of universal grammar sits at the heart of linguistics and also co-founded the Harvard Center for Cognitive Studies. Miller used the data processing of a computer as a model to study how the human mind handles short-term memory. In his famous paper with a mouthful title, The Magical Number 7, Plus or Minus 2, Some Limits on Our Capacity for Processing Information, in 1956, he argued that memory is not one giant storage space, but rather divided and organized like an efficient system, somewhat similar to a channel that information flows through. When we perceive information, it goes through our short-term or working memory. But since our short-term memory has a limited storage capacity, it has to deal with information overload. How does it do it? It organizes information into categories or meaningful chunks, just like any large processing system. Once those meaningful chunks are created, they are easier to store in long-term memory. A good analogy would be how a library stores its endless books. It divides them into categories and subcategories. Miller realized that there was a certain limit to our working memory. It's like our digestive system. The food goes through our mouth where larger ones are crushed into sizable chunks because our esophagus has limited capacity. Of course, when it comes to information, it's not a physical phenomena but a mental one, so you don't need teeth to crush information. So the limit is not physical but rather a mental processing limit. 
he settled on number seven. In many studies prior, he observed that the human mind could generally keep up or hold attention for up to seven elements or chunks of information. Once we are bombarded by more than seven, the memory prioritizes some and ignores the other. A water dam is perhaps a good analogy as it channels water into streams, but since water is a physical matter, the dam bursts when overloaded. The human mind, however, might ignore it first, but if it cannot, it becomes stressed and we might have emotional outbursts when overloaded with too many voices or too many things to remember. But one of the best mechanisms of dealing with information overload is perhaps our long-term memory, where we store things we don't need right now. So the question is, how do we retrieve information once it's stored in our long-term memory? Elvin Tuving, who was born in 1927, an Estonia-born Canadian psychologist who, instead of studying how the memory stores information, focused on how we retrieve the stored memory. Just like Evan House, Tulfing used words to test how memory worked. He used his students as subjects and read a list of words to them. Then he asked them to recall those words. Most of his students were able to recall about 50%. Then, to see if there was any difference, he gave them hints or organized those words into categories like color, animals, food, tools, transport, etc. His students were able to recall more. He concluded that memory works much better when information is organized or compartmentalized into neat categories. Not only that, Tolving also discovered that there was a distinction between two types of long-term memory. Semantic memory, where you store factual information like data, and episodic memory, where you store experiential information like an event or conversation. As a result, he made a distinction as to how we remember and retrieve those memories. Facts and figures are recalled based on meaningful categories like words related to certain group. But episodic memories retrieved not so much by their categories, but by the time and often place, because those memories are often emotional ones. So, we, so he called the retrieval of this kind of memory more akin to time travel to a particular event like a birthday or a party, etc. This episodic memory is beautifully depicted in Marcel Proust's novel In Search of Lost Time, in which he used sensory triggers like smell, sound, taste, touch that can involuntarily transport us to the past event or people we have forgotten. So time and place are extremely crucial when it comes to episodic memory. With semantic or knowledge-based memory, Proust called it voluntary memory and that we can voluntarily recall them. Tulving also said that besides semantic and episodic memories, there was a third type of long-term memory, which he called procedural memory, where we store skills. For example, skills such as driving, cooking, riding, bike, or certain crafts or even playing sports are part of this procedural memory. So to sum up, Tolving used unorthodox techniques to observe long-term memory and divide it into two, factual knowledge or emotional experience. While we can retrieve factual information by organizing them into categories, we retrieve emotional experiences through time and place. Emotional memory. Now that we have understand how human memory works, let's tackle the other elephant in the room, human emotions. How is memory tied to our emotions? Are they related at all? Gordon Bauer, born in 1932, died in 2020, was an American psychologist, and he argued that memory and emotions work in tandem. When in a happy mood, we are more likely to store happy memories, and when unhappy, we tend to store more negative memories. In other words, our mood influences what we remember, and our memory simply obeys our mood. It is the same when we recall. When happy, we recall happy memories, and when in bad mood, we tend to recall unhappy memories better. Quote, People who are happy during the initial experience learn the happy events better. Angry people learn anger-provoking events better. So it turns out what we remember depends on how we feel at the time. 
In other words, happy people tend to remember the positive things while unhappy people tend to remember and recall the negative ones. So Bauer's research found that our emotional state affects our memory. Since our memory is closely tied to our emotions, it also means that what we remember is not necessarily the truth. We all know that our emotions cloud our judgment when it comes to the truth, but do we also remember things that are not true? Elizabeth Loftus, who was born in 1944, is an American psychologist who argued that what we remember is not always the truth. The reason for that is that our memory is closely tied to our emotions, as Gordon Bauer argued earlier, and what we remember depends on our mood. Loftus carried out a study in which she showed her subjects a traffic accident. How she described the crash, her choices of word influenced the subject determining the speed of the cars. If she used words like bump, most subjects thought the cars were moving slow, and when she used the word smash, they thought the cars were moving faster. According to Loftus, our memory of a particular event can be distorted by four distinct factors. One, our current emotions and beliefs. Two, subsequent experiences after the event. Three, other people we trust and four depending on the type of the questions we are asked. In other words, what we think is the truth can be influenced by how we felt at the time, what happened later, other people we love, and shaped by a leading question. Her research was influential in criminal trial procedures where witness testimonies are extremely important in determining the truth of what happened. So sometimes our mood distorts the truth because it makes us feel better if the truth or untruth favored our mood. We create our own stories in our head when we are emotionally invested in an experience which may not reflect reality. Loftus carried out another study in which she collected the stories about her subjects past from their relatives. Among the four stories, one was false, in which the subject was supposedly lost in a shopping mall. While most participants were vague about the mall experience, some accepted it as true. When told that one of the four stories was false, the majority singled out the mall story as false. But what's crucial is that about 20% of the participants chose another story, a true story, to be false. Loftus says, in real life, as well as in experiments, people can come to believe things that never really happened. Of course, this is harmless when it comes to daily lives, but that 20% thinking a false story to be true can have huge legal implications during a trial. Loftus called it false memory syndrome, where some people are able to invent stories that are not true, yet they vehemently believe it in their head. So to sum up, Elizabeth Loftus' research showed that our memory is not as reliable as we think it is. Since our memory is closely tied to our emotions, it can easily be distorted by other factors such as mood, time, people, including who is asking. While harmless in most situations, it can have dire consequences during the legal process. This also proved that human memory is not like a computer because our emotions influence what we remember and what we forget. Since we are pretty selective in what to remember, are we also selective in what we forget? Daniel Schachter, who was born in 1952, an American psychologist, further questioned our memory's reliability. Not only do we forget things, we also get confused, and on some occasions we really want to forget. While memory is an amazing evolutionary tool we have, Schachter focused his attention more on the negative side of memory. While the positives are many, it can also be extremely unreliable. He came up with seven sins of memory. One, it's fleeting. Two, we are absent-minded. Three, we block certain things. Four, we misattribute sources. Five, we are susceptible to suggestions. And six, we are inherently biased. And finally, bad or traumatic memories always persist despite us trying to forget them. In his studies, Schachter concluded that it is a good thing that our memory is unreliable, otherwise we would be overwhelmed with so much useless information. So our brain works because it has to be very selective. Quote, we don't want to memorize every bit of every experience. 
we would be overwhelmed with clutter of useless trivia. So to sum up, cognitive psychology saw how behaviorism simplified the human mind to some behaviors conditioned by the environment. According to cognitive psychology, the mind has a mind of its own that affects the environment through intelligence as well as deeper insights. As a result, our perception of reality is not a passive one-way street that we only receive information randomly, but rather we ask for specific information and even put a structure to all the information we receive. It's like a postal system that not only sorts things out, but also asks for certain information to be stored and retrieved based on our beliefs, convictions, but most crucially based on how we feel. Since our attention is very limited, we have to be selective in how we absorb the information. It's like a data going through a funnel which sorts things out. Useful information is retained and useless information is either discarded or thrown into the unconscious mind where it stays until it's useful or triggered later on. Cognitive psychologists saw memory as the most effective tool of the human mind. We gather information and categorize and organize them for immediate use through our short-term memory or later use through retrieval from long-term memory. We also learned that remembering and retrieving memories is also tied to our emotions. Our mood determines what sort of memories are kept. Also our memory, despite being a great help, also can be unreliable and susceptible to false information. So all these studies lead us to one fundamental question. Is the human brain a powerful computer? While most scientists describe the human brain as a computational and how it deals with information, in recent years, there is a theory that the human brain might be quantum in essence. One of the key proponents of quantum brain is the Nobel Prize winning physicist Roger Penrose. The basic idea is that since the human mind develops in leaps and bounds, it cannot be computational. Consciousness cannot be computational, therefore it might be quantum. But let's leave that debate here and move to how cognitive psychology helps us when it comes to therapy. Cognitive therapy. Cognitive psychology also gave rise to cognitive therapy and the cognitive behavioral therapy. While psychotherapy focused on the unconscious, cognitive therapy is more focused on perception or the conscious mind. Illnesses such as OCD or paranoia has a lot to do with our perception. Therefore, cognitive therapy involves recognition of the problem, rational explanation, and then some behavioral changes in which the patients are active participants. Aaron Beck, born in 1921 and died in 2021, argued that while psychotherapy relied on each patient's account because the unconscious cannot be empirically studied, cognitive therapy on the other hand can be studied empirically because it studies perception which is our consciousness. To treat a disorder, one must understand it on the perceptual level. He likened psychoanalysis to religion because both functioned on faith rather than empirical data. To treat his patients, Beck asked them to assess their perception against reality. In other words, when one compares their thoughts and ideas against the objective reality, one can easily see if their perception of reality is distorted or not. We often make things up in our mind. For example, the world is not as terrifying as some would make up in their mind. Or the world is not as beautiful as some would imagine it to be. A good example is what is called Paris Syndrome, in which the Japanese tourists visiting Paris have a distorted perception of the city as a kind of romantic heaven on earth. When they come face to face with the reality of Parisian people, often cold and rude, their expectations are crushed and then and when they return to Japan they go through a therapy and special clinics set up to treat this syndrome. Another example is the old saying that some people see the glass as half empty while others see it as half full. So our perception of reality has a lot to do how we feel about reality. So cognitive therapy relies on bridging patients perception with this objective reality. Beck famously said don't trust me, test me. So to sum up, Beck had a problem with psychotherapy as it relied on something you couldn't test. So his cognitive therapy was based on perception and how you see the objective reality. 
To cure such disorders, one brings them back to reality and bridges perception with the objective reality. Fun fact: Aaron Beck lived to be 100 years old. So positive thinking and living in reality or surrounding yourself with positive people can influence someone and how they perceive the world and themselves. Another form of treatment has been mindfulness, especially meditation techniques and yoga, which have been trickling down from Eastern religions like Hinduism and Buddhism and Taoism. Since Eastern religions emphasize being in the present, fully aware and fully conscious, which can bring us down from our cloud nine world we have created inside our head. Mihai Chik Sent Mihai, born in 1934 and died in 2021, was a Hungarian American psychologist who emphasized what he called flow, somewhat akin to the Chinese philosophy of Taoism. When we are absorbed in activities we enjoy, we tend to forget time. Not just that, we feel a serenity that gives us clarity of mind. Since we are extremely focused, we also tend to forget our own existence. This he called the state of ecstasy. He wasn't saying that you get this state through drugs, but through work you enjoy the most. Fiction writers, artists, athletes, musicians, and monks experience this when they are fully absorbed in what they do. In other words, they almost transcend from their own body and move into a different realm of reality where mind is neither focused on the past or future, but solely focused on the present activity. How do you achieve this state of flow? One way to achieve it when you challenge yourself. For example, when you are engaged in an activity that matches your level of skill, but the task is slightly more challenging. If something is just too hard, where your skill is nowhere near it, it would make you anxious. Also, if something is extremely easy, you get bored. So the perfect balance is when the task is just slightly above your skill that demands your best effort or eagerness to learn. This matches how we perceive purpose in storytelling. A hero must face challenges and his or her true character comes out in how he or she overcomes problems. So to put it simply, cognitive psychology is mostly focused on attention and memory. So our body gives us sensation through our senses and our mind gives us perception. In other words, how we perceive reality can impact how you see the world and your own capability. So cognitive psychology is a more positive approach compared to behaviorism and psychoanalysis. Why? Because for cognitive psychology, productivity was an important application of their work. While behaviorism blamed conditioning and psychoanalysis blamed the unconscious, cognitive psychologists were interested in how to improve the mental productivity of an individual and make people more competent. It's no coincidence that cognitive psychology came about during the Cold War when the capitalist West wanted to show the socialist East that they had a more superior system of production. So far I've discussed psychology from an individual perspective that we have each a psyche of our own and somewhat operates independent of others. In the next segment I'll discuss social psychology and how society, culture, history and other people influence our mind. Humans are one of the most social species on earth. Eight, social psychology. Previously, I discussed the relation between reality, perception, and memory within cognitive psychology. The focus of cognitive psychology is on the mental processes, psychoanalysis on the subconscious or unconscious, and behavioral psychology on empirical observation of behavior. All these approaches in psychology mainly study the human psyche from an individual perspective. But a lot of what we do experience on the outside is experience with other people. So social psychology tries to answer how much of our psyche is shaped by society and how much of society's psyche is shaped by us. This seems to be a push and pull, a kind of tension between individuals seeking freedom and choices while society pushing you to conform. As we saw, behaviorists explain our behavior partly conditioned by the environment. Psychoanalysis blamed our psychological issues on the dark unconscious. As a response, cognitive psychology puts the blame squarely on the individual, arguing that ultimately individuals have the rational capacity to take responsibility. 
Now, social psychologists saw things from a social perspective that we individuals are under the rule of society, therefore subject to group pressure. So fundamentally, social psychologists want to know the influence of society over the individual, which causes conformity. Another important question social psychologists ask is how the individual push back against society to cause change. Historical context. One of the biggest developments of the 20th century was group thought, either through fascism or socialism. Two quite opposing projects. To put it very crudely, fascism promoted survival of the fittest ideology, while socialism promoted survival of the weakest. Fascism wanted to cull the weak to make space for the strong, while socialism wanted to cull the strong to uplift the dispossessed. Fascism was a more masculine approach that the fittest should survive, while socialism was a more feminine approach that everyone was equal. But both ideologies tapped into our social psychology or tribal thinking. Are we psychologically wired to be tribal and conform with others? As we saw, fascism and socialism united and mobilized a huge number of people in Europe and Asia. Or are we really free thinkers and autonomous individuals as seen with democracies? It turns out there's a push and pull between the individual and societal force which results in social change. Origin of Social Psychology The German philosopher George Hegel argued that the self depends on the existence of others. In other words, a solid idea of the self cannot exist without the existence of other selves within a group or society. He famously argued that we are the product of history. For example, an ancient Greek person is far different compared to an 18th century German in their outlook, sensibilities, and preferences which make up his historical identity. So the root of social psychology can be traced to Hegel, which trickled through Marx and later French school of deconstructionism and postmodernism. Jacques Lacan, born in 1901 and died in 1981, a French psychologist further argued that the individual is created through the language of the other. In other words, a solid self doesn't exist outside the other. So the self can only exist within a group setting. Let's imagine you're the only person in the world. Nobody gave birth to you and nobody came in contact with you. It would be very hard to have a sense of self-identity. A single god in the universe perhaps experiences the same identity crisis. We know ourselves in relations to others. We develop characters because we constantly rub against other people. The first group we encounter is our own family. Virginia Satter, who was born in 1916 and died in 1988, was an American psychologist who argued that family is where we develop personality and role. Therefore, it's like a factory that makes us. Within a family, we grow as we bump into each other, and so we shape each other's personality by feedback, criticism, collusion, and so forth, until we establish a solid self. It's like a pebble that is crushed in the waves, and after years and centuries, it loses all its rough edges and becomes smooth, and we call it pebble. The same is true about us. A totally unruly animal baby turns into a law-abiding citizen after years of education and socialization. But at the heart of it is a push and pull. What is pull? Conformity. After Second World War, there was a thirst among psychologists to explain why so many Germans complied with the Nazis and never questioned their terrible policies. This was particularly a pertinent question among Jewish and those psychologists with some family roots in Eastern Europe. Three of the most famous ones were the Poland-born Solomon Ash, Staley Milgram of Hungarian descent, and his classmate Philip Zimbardo of Italian descent. They carried out experiments to explain how much we conform to society. In other words, we are not as independent thinkers as we believe to be. Solomon Asch, who was born in 1907 and died in 1996, was a Poland-born Jewish-American psychologist who, in 1955, wanted to find out how strong is our urge to conform with society. Of course, in the light of Nazism in Germany, many social scientists were keen to know why so many Germans didn't question Hitler's policies. 
Prior to him in 1935, a Turkish psychologist, Muzaffer Sharif, whose studies showed that individuals tend to conform when there is no clarity of an answer. In a black and white situation, we are less likely to conform with bad policies or accept an erroneous claim. But when there is confusion, we side with the group. You could say that we are inherently lazy. If you are faced with a clear path and treacherous trail, we choose the easy route. But when we face with two dangerous roads, we look to our leaders to tell us what to do. Today in consumerism, people buy products worn by celebrities because we are overwhelmed by the number of choices available. The same is true for YouTube. We watch videos that have more views. But Ash wanted to find out if individuals conform knowing that the group had the wrong answer. His experiment involved 123 male subjects. The subjects were shown two cards. On one, one line, on the other, three lines, each line marked as A, B, and C. They were asked to answer which line, A, B, or C, was the same length as the line on the other card. Ash wanted to know if the subjects would give the answer that conformed with the group. To do this, he always put each unaware target subject within a group of five to seven people who were aware of the experiment. He would ask each person to give an answer. The unaware target subjects would always give their answers last or close to last in the group to test whether the subjects would go against the group by giving the correct answer or conform with the group despite knowing the answer is wrong. In the first stage, there was no group pressure, so only 3 out of 720 gave the wrong answer. But when they were put within a group, more than 30% conformed and gave the wrong answer. Ash saw a clear pattern. Those who went against the grain and stuck with the correct answer consistently did so. And those who were prone to conformity also consistently did so. Ash concluded that the group has a huge influence on some individuals. If the test is done in private, people stick with the right answer. However, in groups, the pressure of conformity is strong enough that people give the wrong answer despite knowing the correct answer. From this, we can conclude that the group has a power to bend the truth. We might go against the truth in order to conform with our group. We often do not tell the truth out of politeness or fear of consequences. Stanley Milgram, who was born in 1933 and died in 1984, was another Jewish American psychologist who worked alongside Solomon Ash to study how individuals conform in society. After the Second World War, Nazi leaders were put on trial and they claimed that they were following orders. Milgram argued that we tend to comply despite our own personal values because we are taught to obey rules at an early age. To prove that people do what they are told to do, in 1961 at Yale University, he set up an experiment in which ordinary people would inflict electric shocks when they were ordered by those above them. The subjects were told that the experiment was to find whether punishment helped learning or not. The subjects were told to inflict electric shock of varying degrees on learners who gave the wrong answers. Milgram found that all participants applied shocks of up to 300 volts on the learners who would scream in pain. 65% of participants obeyed orders to apply a maximum shock of 450 volts. Only 35% of participants refused to obey when the learners screamed in pain. However, Milgram also found that the participants showed discomfort and distress while obeying orders, which shows that the pressure of conformity is so high that the participants were enduring a huge discomfort while obeying orders. Quote, Ordinary people simply doing their jobs and without any particular hostility on their part they can become agents in a terrible destructive process. Some people criticize it saying that because the study was conducted in a university environment where participants were paid to take part, therefore they were more willing to obey. However, the experiment was replicated in 2006 by Mel Slater using vertical reality and the results were pretty much the same. Stanley Milgram concluded that obedience is not inherent in one culture, but in all cultures. 
Humans have evolved in tribal settings since the dawn of time, so aligning oneself with the tribe or the authority is a survival tactic we're all evolved with. Since Stanley Milgram's experiment involved obeying orders from authority, his colleague Philip Zimbardo, who was born in 1933, wanted to know if the participants would inflict pain without an authority telling them to do so. In his famous 1971 Stanford prison experiment, he selected 24 ordinary students and, and randomly gave some the role of prisoners and some the role of guards. The guards were to arrest the prisoners and keep them in the basement of the university for a period of time. The guards also wore military uniforms and had to strip search the prisoners and had complete power over the prisoners and their job was to keep order. The results were as shocking as Milgram's experiment. In performing their duties, the guards quickly became abusive, denying prisoners food or toilet and even used them to amuse themselves and their boredom. The situation became so terrible that after six days, the experiment had to be stopped. Zimbardo concluded that any good person under the right condition or wrong condition can turn nasty and do terrible things. Once we assume a role under some given rules, we tend to take it too far if pushed. So far, we have seen that individuals are pushed by society. They have the capacity to conform, in some cases much to the detriment of their own psychological state. This can be seen among soldiers who after a brutal war suffer immensely for what they did or witnessed. So how do you liberate individuals from the tyranny of social conformity? Or how to enhance our ability to make the right moral choices in life? Or how to go against the normalization of society? If psychological trauma affects the individual, it can also affect an entire group. Creative freedom or push Eric Fromm, the German psychologist, argued that the problem most modern people face is loneliness due to our separation, first from nature due to our ability to reason, and secondly our separation from others due to modern disintegration of community, family and groups. His antidote was love, not in the usual sense. This freedom is the capacity to encompass the world and reconnect with nature as well as other people through imaginative art. Creative artists do not seek conformity, but rather choose loneliness in order to capture something deeper. So creative freedom is an antidote to conformity, but artists are a minority in society. If you are subject to conformity, we can also suffer as a community. So the question is, how do you heal an entire group? Ignacio Martin Barro born in 1942 and died in 1989, was born in Spain but spent most of his life in Latin America. Through his research, he came to the conclusion that trauma was more a community issue rather than individual. For him, while mental problems could happen under normal circumstances, some other mental illnesses were the results of a harsh man-made environment, such as brutal oppression of some regimes. His solution was liberation psychology, in which his focus was on improving the lives of those marginalized in society. Many traumatic experiences among people, particularly in El Salvador, Argentina, Chile and other Latin American countries he studied were caused by dictatorship, wars and violence in general. His conclusion was that psychological problems are often context-driven and reflects the history and politics of the place involved. While Martin Barrow's antidote to social trauma was liberation and self-governance, another psychologist offered the choice to be part of a community as an antidote to loneliness and suffering as it empowered us to take responsibility. William Glasser, born in 1925 and died in 2013, was an American psychologist. In 1956, he developed what is called choice theory, which is a kind of utilitarian approach in which individuals are driven by increasing their pleasure and avoiding pain. But the best way we can achieve these goals is within a social community. Since we are by nature social beings or a bunch of social animals, as Aristotle has said 2,500 years ago, therefore our natural or instinctive urge to belong to a community is as strong as our urge to find food or find partner. The only way we feel fulfilled is through society. 
while society allows us fulfillment, but on the flip side, most of our psychological problems are also caused by our relationships with others, including family, friends, colleagues, and society in general. Glasser offered what he called reality therapy, which is based on taking responsibility for the choices we make. This is very similar to existentialist philosopher John Paul Sartre, as well as Soren Kierkegaard. In other words, we understand and accept the reality of our lives and take responsibility for our actions. But this can only be achieved if individuals are free to make choices. If we are forced to conform, one cannot have the options to make choices. While some societies allow us to make certain choices, it all varies from country to country or culture to culture. One of the deepest psychological and freedom is what's called this process of normalization. Every society has certain norms and anyone who deviates from those norms are either punished or ostracized as crazy. Eliad Aronson, born in 1932, in his 1972 book The Social Animal argued that we are all crazy in some way and given the right time and place we may act in a crazy way. Those who do crazy things are not necessarily crazy, he said. He looked at a shooting that happened in 1970 when armed officers shot dead some anti-war protesters. Aronson studied the reaction of the people in town who wanted to spread rumors that the protesters were bad people in order to prove that the officers did nothing wrong. Those false rumors were the results of cognitive dissonance when two contradictory beliefs force you to change the narrative. We somehow justify some acts of cruelty simply to avoid the emotional conflict it causes us if we accept the truth. For example, the discomfort a family of a criminal feels when helping the police to capture the culprit. Change versus familiarity While society prefers clear norms and pushes individuals to conform, some individuals do not follow these norms. So this battle between norm and rebellion will continue as long as we live, and this struggle is an important factor in social change. So there's a tension between social norms and individual freedom. Martin Seligman, born in 1942, is an American psychologist who argued that we are the happiest when in good social relationships. Quote, Good social relationships are like food and thermoregulation, universally important to human mood. During his research, he noticed that the happiest people were those who were good with other people. But being good is one thing, changing a society for the good is a whole different thing. Robert Zajong, born in 1923 and died in 2008, was a Polish-American psychologist who wanted to understand the relation between feeling and thought. He carried out studies which became known as the mere exposure effect. He read an article about a student who attended his class in a black bag. At first, other students were hostile towards him, but as time went on, they became familiar with the site and slowly accepted his bizarre clothing item. In 1968, Zajong developed a series of experiments in which he showed his participants a series of images and some Chinese symbols. He observed that the longer the subjects were exposed to those images and symbols, the more close they felt towards those images. The participants claimed that these images were their own, which led Zajong to conclude that the more you see it, the more you like it. A good example might be a security blanket among babies. The more you spend time with someone or something, the higher likelihood of you being attached to them. This led Zajong to conclude that our preferences are not always rational but deeply emotional. He also argued that while thoughts and feelings are separate, all thoughts are somehow attached to feelings. Today, advertisers target people precisely because the more you see their products, the more we accept them, perhaps not on a rational level, but on an emotional level. Another example is when animals are exposed to something, at first they show fear and aggression, but when they realize nothing happens, they accept it. We tend to be fearful and hostile towards new people, new experiences and changes, but the more we spend time with them, we come to accept them. Zajong also studied couples and long-term relationships. He noticed a bizarre effect which seems unbelievable. 
He looked at their wedding photographs and then compared those photos with their photographs after 25 years of living together. He found that the couples look more alike after 25 years than when they first met. In other words, they looked very different when they got married, but after spending 25 years together, even their physiology had changed to conform to each other. He argues that the more you spend time with someone, the more you develop empathy for others. And as a result, your facial expressions mimic one another. Perhaps we all have seen couples who look like one another, and then they are different. Another explanation could be that we choose our mate who is more similar to us than different in order to ensure our similar genes survive. So perhaps a couple mimicking each other's facial expression is in a way to mimic that we are from the same gene pool or tribe. But when it comes to society, nothing is written in stone. We change as we evolve biologically and socially. But this change is also subtle that we do not clearly see the forces at play. While Hegel and Marx talked about the force of history, what is that invisible force that changes society and individuals? Kurt Levin, who was born in 1890 and died in 1947, a German-American psychologist, is often credited as the father of social psychology, who was active in the 1940s, when three dominant ideologies, socialism, fascism, and liberalism, were battling one another. According to behavior psychology, individuals are mostly at the mercy of the environment, while Levin wanted to know whether the individual can also affect the environment in return. In his field theory, he argues that one cannot understand a system or environment unless one tries to change it. By changing a system, one realizes the forces that are at play. It's like you want to uproot a tree. Then you realize the roots and how deep they are. Or you cannot understand the force of a river until you try to change its course. The same is true about society. The Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy argued that historical events are not caused by leaders, but by a variety of forces from the soldiers to the cooks to the ordinary peasants. Levin's theory is based on the interdependence of individuals within a group. Any social change is often met with resistance, but once people see a rationale behind the move, they concede. He studied dietary change during World War II and found that once the participants knew the benefits of such change, they came on board. Change is terrifying at first until proven safe or necessary. Social psychology has mainly focused on two fronts, how the individual is influenced by the group. Studies in the 60s and 70s showed that the group or authority has a huge influence on how we behave. In extreme situations, we do things that are horrible in order to conform with others or comply with authority or simply play a role we are given. Other social psychologists focus on the choices we make and how society is the source of our happiness, fulfillment and meaning in life, yet our social relations are also the cause of many of our mental problems. In the next segment, I'll look at child psychology. Nine, child psychology. In the previous segment, I discussed the influence of society over the individual and how we are wired to conform to group pressure and how we also have the capacity to rebel and change society through individual freedom. Another important factor in human psychology is age. So in this segment, I'll discuss some of those differences by shedding lights on child psychology. As we saw in earlier segments, behavior is mainly focused on the behavioral aspect of learning, while psychoanalysis, Freud in particular, focused on the unconscious aspect of learning process. Despite acknowledging child psychology to be slightly different from adults, however, the conventional wisdom was that a child was simply a yet-to-be adult, therefore had the same psychology as adults, but lacked maturity or experience. However, in the 1930s and 40s, because cognitive psychology emerged as a dominant approach, the view shifted from a child being a small adult to a child psychology being different, and children going through distinct psychological changes as they grow up. This is especially true in children's cognitive abilities and learning. For example, language learning is far easier for children than adults. Children go through distinct psychological phases as they grow up. Another area of child psychology has been attachment and separation anxiety. For example, children have the capacity to be attached to an adult at a younger age, 
but as they grow they appear to lose that ability. Which is perhaps an evolutionary survival tactic when we are most vulnerable and need an adult to look after them. Some psychologists also studied how children learn morality and also the prevalence of autism in recent decades, especially among boys. Nature versus Nurture The debate of nature versus nurture is an old one. This is particularly pertinent in child psychology. How much of our psychology is determined by our genetic makeup and how much of it is due to a culture? One of the most important questions about children is language learning, which shows how it is wired in nature and nurtured in culture. So our linguistic ability has one tentacles in nature and one in culture as we learn the language of our community. Noam Chomsky was born in 1928, wanted to know how children learn a language. Human's ability to verbally communicate complex ideas is unique in the animal kingdom. While behaviorist psychologists believe that we learn a language like any other skills as a direct result of our environment through trial and error. We throw a rock and see what happens. We utter a word and see how others react. Often parents correct or say another word. So children learn by imitating as well as getting feedback from their parents and others. Chomsky however disagreed with behaviorists. He says that the ability to learn a language is innate in humans. Why is it that almost all children learn to talk precisely at relatively same age? In the same way that children go through puberty at around the same age, babies start walking by the ages of one and talking by two. Chomsky says the language organ grows like any other body organ. His theory of universal grammar states that children innately know the basic structure of a language without being taught those linguistic rules. Not just that, the human anatomy, including the vocal organ, brain, and auditory system is geared towards verbal communication. While most psychologists and linguists agree with Chomsky that our linguistic ability is instinctive and hardwired in our biology, some criticize it for being too rigid and ignoring environmental, adoptive, social and other cognitive factors in shaping our linguistic ability. While our linguistic ability is innate, the environment can enhance or limit its development just as a seed without water doesn't grow into a tree. There are a few examples of feral children grown up in the wild who never fully master the ability to speak a language properly. Another example is language learning among adults. Most adults cannot compete with most children in their ability to learn language. Even if adults can master the language, they cannot mimic the accent as successfully as children. This suggests that language learning has a time clock after which it becomes harder. If children have an advantage when it comes to language learning, do they have an advantage when it comes to general cognitive abilities too? Jean Piaget, who was born in 1899 and died in 1980, was a Swiss psychologist. He was interested in how children's intelligence or cognitive ability changes as they grow. While most behavior psychologists focused on environmental conditioning as an external factor, Piaget wanted to study the inner workings of a child's inner or innate cognitive transformation. He devised interview techniques in which he would let the children answer questions in their own way. He didn't have a multiple choice or predetermined answers or even questions. Instead, he wanted to know if children's thought process was different from adults. He would often follow a child's line of thought. He observed that the child's mind is fundamentally different from that of an adult. He noticed that adults have more capacity for reflection while children are prone to acting. While studying babies before they could speak, he noticed they act out a lot. This continues as children grow up and act out their ideas through play acting. We have all seen how children love playing and play acting. Perhaps they don't have the capacity for reflection simply because they are too busy acting things out. Or perhaps because adults are too lazy to act things out so they prioritize thinking, instruction and reflection rather than the energy intensive execution of many things or action. As we grow up, we plan things before executing, while children act out first before planning, if ever. P. 
Piaget concluded that children primarily learn by doing, so their cognitive process and how they think is not so much tied to verbal instructions from others, but more so by their own action. They don't listen to social cues as much as they listen to the consequences of their actions. Quote, intelligence is what you use when you don't know what to do. Piaget came up with four stages of cognitive development. The first stage is sensory motor in which babies of under two years of age learn by touch, taste and other senses. The first reaction of a baby to something is to touch and put it in their mouth. In other words, pick it up and taste it. The second stage called pre-operational starts when babies are self-aware. During this stage, children can arrange and categorize objects, put them in the order of size, color, and so forth. The third stage is concrete operational, when children understand quantities, differentiates objects by several factors such as color, size, and shape. The fourth stage is formal operational when a child is capable of abstract thoughts, hypothetical situations, and imaginary scenarios. Piaget believed children not only have an innate ability to learn, they also have a thirst for learning. In other words, children are biologically hardwired to learn and be curious, and learn not by listening to others, but by doing through their own actions. This is especially true among boys. Today we hear a lot about schools failing boys. The argument made is that boys are more prone to action than listening. So boys are not evolved to sit behind a desk for hours without some physical work. The argument is that modern education system favors girls simply because girls are evolved to rely less on their physical capacity but more on their social skills which includes the ability to listen to instructions. Modern education system made for girls, so to speak. This also seems to benefit Asian Americans in America as they make up almost 20% of Harvard's student body while the community only represents 5% of the country's population. Your physical size can handicap you but it forces you to pursue academia. While very few women can compete with men in sports, they are outperforming men in schools and universities. This same is true for Asian Americans, very little representation in sports, but very high representation in universities to the point that universities like Harvard actively try to reduce the number of Asians from entering as their pass rate is much higher compared to other races. Today universities are changing as more and more girls fill the classes. So in the future universities will be filled with Asians and women. I'm only joking. Piaget's active learning approach was adopted in education, especially in Montessori schools, in which the focus was on learning by doing. One of the criticisms of Piaget's work has been that he minimized the role of adult in a child's education, because he solely attributed learning and thinking as innate and biological, neglecting the social side of learning and thought process. In contrast to Piaget's too naturalistic approach, the Russian psychologist Lev Vygotsky, born in 1899 and died in 1934, argued that a child's cognitive development or learning is tied to their social circle, i.e. parents, teachers, and peers. He argued that not only our knowledge is in essence social, so is our thought process. How we think is influenced by the culture we grow up in, the people who we interact with, and our own individual experiences with the physical world. While Piaget emphasized the child's innate proclivity towards learning by doing, Vygotsky argued that society can also facilitate learning. Another study that confirmed the role of social circle on learning was done by Bruno Bettelheim, born in 1903, died in 1990, who studied children growing up in Israeli kibbutz, communities where children, instead of living with their parents, lived in communal houses. Instead of a nuclear family setting, these children lived with other kids and were cared by many adults. The results showed that these children grew up to be more accomplished adults, emphasizing the role of the social circle in a child's learning and cognitive development. 
To conclude the debate of nature versus nurture, it's neither one or the other, but a mixture of both. At birth, we are pre-assembled with abilities to learn language, develop complex cognitive abilities, but these can only happen or blossom within a culture. So nature and nurture are two sides of the same coin. Attachment theory. If our linguistic and some cognitive abilities are age-specific, what other aspects of our development is age-specific? Psychologists like Sigmund Freud and Conrad Lorenz argued that infants are attached to the first caregiver or moving object they encounter. In other words, we are programmed to seek attachment to the person or object nearest to us, but in reality it is far more complicated than that. John Bowlby, born in 1907, died in 1990, was a British psychologist who wanted to study how babies bond with their mothers arguing that this might be an innate survival trait. Following Freud's assertion that children become attached to their caregivers because they fulfill their physiological needs like food, Bowlby believed that this genetic bond is always with a female figure more than a male figure. If this bond is broken, the negative consequences would remain with the child throughout his or her life. In the 1950s, he studied children who were evacuated during World War II and raised in large institutions. These kids didn't have a bond with any female figure like their mother, so to speak. He found that this experience negatively influenced the children's intellectual, social, and emotional abilities. And in extreme cases, the maternal deprivation caused what he termed as affectionless psychopathy. A lot of the children ended up becoming thieves or developed juvenile delinquencies and antisocial behaviors. A great rendition of this idea is depicted in a Hungarian novel, The Notebook Trilogy by Agoda Kristof, in which during the war two boys were separated from their mother and did develop a sense of amoral behavior. Bowlby also argued that the role of the father was not as strong as a mother, especially at a younger age, as a father's role is more provisioning and protection. He was, however, criticized for minimizing the role of the father. Later research found that a father is as good a parent as a mother. So to sum up, Bowlby found that we are biologically programmed to be attached to a female figure. Why female figure? Well, the simple answer, according to Freud, is that our first source of food is a mother, or a cupboard love, as he called it. So biologically speaking, it makes sense to get attached to your first local restaurant that gives you free food for months through breastfeeding. However, this view is challenged by other psychologists. Harry Harlow, born in 1905, died in 1981, was one of those psychologists who challenged Freud's cupboard love theory. Harlow studied macaque infants separated from their mothers. He set up an experiment in which he would give them fake surrogate mothers, one with wire in which a bottle of milk was attached and the other just soft cuddly cloth. If Freud was correct, the infants would only stay with a mother who gave them milk. But it turned out the baby monkeys stayed with a cuddly cloth far more and used it as a shield to protect themselves when there was a terrifying noise. It turned out the baby monkeys needed a mother not just for feeding them, but also protecting them and giving them that soft, cushiony environment that was safe. So attachment went beyond the mere physiological need. It is a base, foundation or platform upon which babies explore the world. Harlow's 1957 to 1963 study had a huge influence on parenting in the decades that followed. The role of the parents was to make sure children grow up in the most protected and softest environment possible. You could say that the current generation of snowflakes are the children of the parents who grew up in the 1970s and 80s experiencing over-parenting themselves? Joking aside, parenting used to be more about providing enough food some centuries ago, but in recent decades, since food is so readily available that some parents thinking they were not doing enough and overcompensating and creating a safer space, perhaps too cuddly space that some people never had the chance to grow up a thicker skin. So much so that children cannot even play in parks anymore in case their knees are skinned. 
Today, universities have become a safe space where criticism or simple words are banned. Okay, let me stop here before I offend someone. So to conclude, Harlow's monkey studies showed that attachment goes beyond just food, but also security. It makes sense, babies need a lot of food and a lot of safe space. Today, a lot of people in some rich countries are obese, but also with a fragile personality. I should really shut up. But how do you balance between protection and independence? If babies grow up too attached, they don't develop independence and strong character. So our next psychologist tackled this question head on. Mary Ainsworth, born in 1913 and died in 1999, who worked with John Bowlby, wanted to find out how babies become independent from their attachment. Her research focused on baby and mother interactions. During her study, she placed a one-year-old baby and their mother in a room. She observed their interaction before and after a stranger entered the room, as well as a period in which the baby was alone with the stranger. She specifically focused on how the baby reacted when the mother returned to the room. She concluded three patterns, which she termed as three attachment types, secure, anxious avoidant, and anxious resistant. About 70% of babies had secure attachment, meaning they were distressed when the mother left, but still happily continued to play with the stranger. About 15% of the babies didn't care when their mothers left, so Ainsworth called them anxious avoidant. Another 15% became very anxious in the presence of a stranger, so she called them anxious resistant. She concluded that how a mother meets the needs of their children creates these attachment types. However, others have criticized her arguing that attachment is not permanent, but always subject to change as babies develop. So how do you grow up to become less dependent on your parents? One way we develop autonomy is through expression. G. Stanley Hall, born in 1844 and died in 1924, was an American psychologist. He combined Darwinian evolution with Romanticism literature. The 18th century Sturm and Drank, Storm and Stress, is a collection of romanticist literature and music that emphasize romantic expression as young people experience love. One of the most famous novels in this genre is The Sorrow of Young Werther by the father of German literature, Goethe, in which love is seen as a volcanic eruption, especially in teenagers. The desire for sex is nature's expression as love in young adult humans. So Stanley Hall observed this individual expression during adolescence as an emotional turmoil and rebellion between the age of 11 and 15. This is a period, historically speaking, a child was leaving the nest for a nest of their own, so they would fall in love while pursuing a mate, as well as seeking acceptance. Quote, Adolescence is when the very worst and best impulses in the human soul struggle against each other for possession. As a result of this titanic emotional battle, we develop a sense of autonomy for our early attachment. So girls leave their father in search of a husband, and boys leave their mother in search of a wife. The stereotype of men searching for a second mother and girls for a second father and their future partner seems apt. This is beautifully depicted in the world's first novel written 1000 years ago, one of the most psychological novels of Japanese literature, The Tale of Genji, in which the main character, Prince Genji, is searching for a perfect wife that resembles his own mother. So, we saw that some of our early childhood developments are innate. For example, we have an innate ability to learn language, learn skills, and even get attached at a specific age. But they do not happen in vacuum, so just as culture is needed to grow bacteria, we humans also need a culture to grow and develop in. Violence and Morality since nature and culture play a dynamic role, one of the most important topics of child psychology has been morality. For example, are children taught violence or are they prone to violence somewhat innately? But more precisely, how do children learn moral values? Albert Bandura, born in 1925 and died in 2021, was a Canadian psychologist who wanted to know whether aggression is learned or innate. 
The issue of violence on TV and in video games has been on our consciousness ever since these devices were invented. Behavior psychologists such as B.F. Skinner believed we learn through environmental conditioning of rewards and punishment, while Freud argued that we tend to assimilate the behavior of others into our own, mostly unconsciously. So in 1961, Bandura devised a study known as the Bobo Doll Experiment to find how much of the child's aggression is learned by observing and imitating others and whether we model our behavior on other people's behaviors or not, and whether we see others do it and then we copy it. He chose 36 boys and 36 girls between the ages of 3 and 6. He then divided them into three groups of 24, with 12 boys and 12 girls. The first group saw no adult role model, so it was used as a control group. The second group was shown an adult role model being aggressive, physically and verbally towards a bobo doll, kicking it, throwing it on the floor, hitting it with a mallet. The third group was shown an adult model who was passive. After the exposure, each child was left alone in the room with the doll. The results showed that children imitated the role model and how they treated the doll. Children who had seen the aggressive adult model were more likely to be aggressive towards the doll. Bandura concluded that when we witness violence or aggression either in real life or on screen can influence us. Some believe that reading about or seeing aggression in books and movies allows us to let out those feelings as a kind of cathartic release. Bandura however disagrees. Quote, Exposure to aggressive modeling is hardly cathartic. So to sum up, Bandura showed in his experiment that aggressive behavior is not only adaptive or due to environmental conditioning, but is also socially learned and imitated from those around us. Aggressiveness might be innate, but it can manifest more if we are exposed more. This brings us to the question of how children learn morality. In 1956, Lawrence Kohlberg, born in 1927 and died in 87, conducted a 20-year-long study of how children learn morality, involving 56 boys aged 10 to 16 who were tested every three years. According to this study, we humans go through three different stages of moral development. First, in the pre-conventional stage, we associate good and bad with reward and punishment or carrot and stick. So we learn morality by its outcome in terms of rewards and punishment. Parents or society rewards good behavior and punish bad ones. In the second level or conventional stage, we understand the intention behind moral behavior. So not only we understand the outcome in terms of reward and punishment, but we also know why an action is considered morally good or bad by the society. At this point, we set out our goals to maximize the good actions while minimizing the bad ones in order to conform to society and navigate the social conventions. At this stage, in some cases, sometimes we take it to extreme level when young people become revolutionaries or join radical groups thinking they can bring about social justice. The third level or post-conventional stage is when we move beyond conformity. It means we see an action while acceptable in society is not morally good. For instance, if you serve a repressive regime or a bad institution, you stand up and raise your hand, which might result in you being punished. Whistleblowers are an example. Another example is leaders like Gandhi who stood up to injustice without resorting to violence. So in essence, morality is an evolutionary necessity that is socially learned and reinforced. First, good actions are rewarded and bad ones are punished. Second, we understand the intention behind moral choices. And third, we transcend our self-interest in doing what's morally right, even if it means harm to ourselves. This is beautifully depicted in Mark Twain's novel Huckleberry Finn, in which the teenager protagonist, despite his moral teaching from his church community, rebels to protect a slave from the authorities. He experiences the typical moral dilemmas of what is right inside him and what's right on the outside, and ultimately decides saving a slave from recapture is the right thing, even though the society doesn't think so. 
life's purpose. Since we are born with certain innate genetic qualities, but also influenced by the society we live in, what is the purpose of it all? In other words, how do we navigate life as we grow up? Is there a story or meaning behind a child's development? When we plant a tomato, we have a purpose in mind. We want to eat some delicious tomatoes at the end. Is there a psychological story for a child's growing up? Eric Erikson, born in 1902, died in 1994. A German-American psychologist believed in the epigenetic principle that all living organisms have a purpose to fulfill their lives. He suggested that humans go through eight distinct stages in life in the pursuit of fulfilling their life's purpose. In each stage, we are faced with two opposite paths, much like the hero's journey in all stories, who must go through many trials to become a hero. These stages, according to Erickson, are 1. Helpless infant learn to trust or mistrust their parents depending on how they meet their needs. 2. Autonomy versus shame or doubt builds up in two-year-olds as they judge their abilities through their own successes and failures in navigating things. 3. Initiative versus guilt takes place in age 3 to 6 when children's creativity blossoms or tamed through punishment as they explore things. 4. Industry versus inferiority takes place among those aged 6 to 12 when children learn competency or lack of it. 5. Ego identity versus role confusion is when children are 12 to 18. During this stage, children either learn who they are or experience an identity crisis. Stage 6 is between 18 to 30 when a person learns either intimacy or isolation in how they bond with a partner to build a solid relationship. Stage 7 is between 35 and 60 when a person experiences generativity or stagnation in how they feel about their contribution to society at large. These last stages after the age of 60 when a person feels ego integrity or despair. In this stage, people reflect on their life journey as a whole and whether they feel satisfied or despair over their prospect of death. To sum up, Erickson's theory matches a neat little story for our lives. We go through many crossroads, trials and tribulations and how we navigate those hurdles can send us in the right or wrong path. This binary narrative fits in with more philosophical or even religious ideas that combine our natural proclivities with our environmental factors, so development is always a mix of both nature and nurture. So to conclude, child psychology broke away from behavior psychology, stating that children's psyche is vastly different from an adult's psyche. We are genetically equipped with certain biological traits, but they tend to be age-specific, like the ability to learn linguistic rules, as Chomsky said, and Piaget's innate cognitive proclivity towards learning by action. While grown-ups can learn by listening, children learn faster by doing. Other psychologists try to highlight the social side of learning, the influence of parents and teachers, arguing that thought process and learning are inherently social. Other psychologists focused on how mother-child attachment is wired in our genes for survival, but also solid foundation, which allows us to explore the world more confidently. Some psychologists looked at how we develop morality and prejudice. But the topic of autism, which has been on the rise in recent decades, posed a very different question. Why is autism predominantly a problem among boys? This is a perfect segue for our next topic and next segment, which is psychology of the sexes. How do males and females are different and how do they see each other and the world differently? Ten, sexual psychology. In the previous segment, I discussed how children are different from adults and some of our psychological traits are age-related, such as our linguistic and cognitive learning abilities. We lose the ability to learn a language successfully after a certain age. I also discussed how children are wired to get attached to their provider and protectors. In this segment, I'll discuss the psychology of the sexes. Are men and women different in their psyche? Sexual dimorphism. One of the most important human behaviors is mating and reproduction. 
After food insecurity, sexual urge is the strongest instinct in animals, including humans. As animals, our basic biological purpose in life is to survive in order to mate and reproduce future generations. As a result, a lot of what we do on a daily basis are directly or indirectly influenced by our urge to mate. Homo sapiens are dimorphic, which means male and female sexes have to mate to reproduce. This also means that males and females are different in size, reproduction cost, and fertility window. Males are generally bigger than females. Another huge difference is the cost of mating. For males, there's little or no cost when mating, but for females, it means nine months of pregnancy and a very painful birth, and throughout history, a high chance of death at childbirth. Another major difference is the fertility window. Men stay fertile much longer and more constantly, while females have a shorter monthly window as well as a shorter overall fertility window as females experience menopause. Due to these basic biological differences, men and women have different mating strategies which influence our behaviors towards each other. On a more physiological level, men produce more testosterone than women, which makes us more aggressive, while women produce more estrogen, which is more bonding chemical. As a result, the urge for sex differs between men and women. In general, men have a much stronger drive to have sex than women. For women, the urge for sex goes up and down during their monthly cycle, peaking during ovulation. While for men, the urge to have sex remains at a higher level throughout the month and throughout their lives. Research shows that men are more willing to have sex casually, therefore they treat sex as a more physical act, while women tend to treat sex as an emotional experience. This is because biologically women take a far greater risk when in having sex due to pregnancy and birth. In today's world, due to contraceptives, this risk is minimized, but the psychological hardwiring in women still prevents them from having sex with anyone, so they are still far more selective than men. Since men take no physiological risk during pregnancy, there is little genetic hardwiring in us to avoid sex. While for a man, a risk mainly comes from social, legal, or financial standpoints if he impregnates a woman. But for women, the risk is physiological, and in pre-modern time, it also meant a huge survival risk. For example, historically for women, it was a matter of life and death. But for men, sex was just a great opportunity to pass on their genes. So throughout history, generally speaking, men were seeking sex, while women wanted commitment. The stereotype that men want sex and women want love is somewhat true because women want the men to stick around after sex. The romantic archetypes too differ. For women, it's a strong beast who can be tamed and for men, it's the damsel in distress that can be rescued. So the beauty and the beast are very different in what they really want. Men are more visual, so beauty plays an important role, while women are more auditory, so they prioritize the ability to tell good and interesting stories. How do these differences emerge in boys and girls? According to studies conducted by Masters and Johnsons in the 1950s and 60s, boys and girls grow at a similar rate until puberty. After puberty, the differences start to show more drastically. Boys tend to show more aggression due to high levels of testosterone, while girls tend to show neuroticism due to high level of estrogen. So boys express themselves through physical confrontations like fights and sports, while girls express themselves through gossip and storytelling. According to the British biologist Lewis Walpern, who was born in 1921, men are modified women. He argues that male and female embryos are identical, except the female has the XX chromosomes while the male has XY. He speculates that we are all conceived as female, but male embryos change because instead of two X chromosomes, they have one X and one Y. This even plays in language we call Mother Nature, not Father Nature. Instead, we have a Father God or a Sky Father. Lewis Wolpert also argues that agriculture developed because of women's gathering role within the human race. Men were hunters, therefore spent far more time away while the females stayed behind and gathered fruits and vegetables, which led to the agricultural revolution. 
This is not scientific, but in agricultural civilizations like China and India, they tend to be more feminine. In fact, Hinduism encourages vegetarianism within its religious teachings. In a novel titled Wolf Totem by the Chinese author Jiang Rong, he relates his own observation of spending time among the Mongols and saw how different they were from the Chinese in terms of masculinity because Mongols were predominantly hunters and herders while the Chinese were predominantly farmers. Of course, it's a work of fiction, but generally it's accepted among biologists that we are made of what we do and what we eat. This is why Kenyans dominate long-distance running sports like marathon. So Walpert argues that agriculture allowed cities and civilization to flourish and this made men to be more like women, staying in one place or attached to a piece of land. As a result, city walls and country walls were built to defend against other wandering hungry men. But going back to physiological differences, the American neuroscientist Paul Zak, born in 1962, studied brain chemicals and found that women release more oxytocin. Oxytocin is a nurturing chemical in which you understand and sympathize with others and sometimes it's called the moral chemical because it's released when you do morally good things like helping and looking after someone else. The reason for that is that estrogen, which women have more of, encourages the release of oxytocin. As a result, women are far better nurturers and more social. Women also have relatively larger hippocampus where we store long-term memory, which helps them to store more emotional data. This is why women notice subtle emotional differences on other people. This emotional sensitivity when gone to the extreme leads to neuroticism, which is far more common among women than men. Polzak also found that testosterone, predominantly the male hormone, blocks oxytocin. This explains male aggression. Throughout history, men were the soldiers and fighters. The physical beasts therefore had less necessity for understanding social cues. Mating urges. When it comes to mating, males and females have almost opposing strategies. Generally, females want taller men, while males want shorter females. Females want strong masculine men, while males want soft feminine women. But among the human species, it's generally the females who are the selectors. How do we know that? When it comes to cognitive abilities, the male bill curve is far wider than female. Polzak argues that since males fall on both sides of the IQ extremes, the most intelligent as well as the least intelligent, is because women are the selectors, so they usually select the most intelligent as better candidates for mating and security. In other words, the spectrum of intelligence is wide enough among men so females can have a choice. If all men were of the same level of intelligence, females would have a really hard time choosing. The ability to be financially well off is generally tied to a man's level of intelligence. In 1969, Hudson and Hens conducted research in which they found that women found a man's financial ability very important, while for men it was merely desirable. David Buss, born in 1953, the American evolutionary psychologist, in his popular book, The Evolution of Desire, explains males and females' dating and mating strategies. While most of the book deals with the studies done by other psychologists, he also carried out some studies in the 80s and later on, and it was consistent that women generally prefer men who provide it financially. These seem to be cross-cultural and around the world. Females generally see financial stability at the top of their mating priority. It makes sense since women go through pregnancy and childbirth during which they need help with food and security. There's an argument that technological advancement and modern comfort have come about because women asked for it. In other words, women want a man who can build a safe and comfortable nest, i.e. a place made of marbles. Therefore, men have had the strongest urge to tame the world. This is why men take risk when it comes to work. For example, more than 90% of work-related deaths are males because men take higher risk in the hope of finding or maintaining their partners. But in the pre-modern world, maternal mortality was extremely high, so women took a massive risk by mating in general, and mating with a weak man was a huge risk. 
Another important criteria by which women select their mates is based on a man's status. The most desirable men are athletes, singers, CEOs, anyone who is respected within their community. Women, mostly young women, flock to sleep with these high status men. There is an argument that it is in fact other men who help females select their mate. Since males respect those who rise above them either through competence, creativity or power, this in turn allows females to choose those men who are respected by other men. This is tied with security. If other men respect a man, he is more likely to be a safer bet than someone who is not respected by other men. When it comes to age, Bus also found that women prefer men older than themselves. The reason is that the older men tend to have more excess resources and have acquired more status or are generally more mature. Ambition, intelligence, hard work, height and strength are other selection criteria for women. He concluded that females look for survival traits. What is surprising is that when he studied women who are financially successful themselves, they have an even stronger urge to find a mate who is financially on the same level or better. This is often called female hypergamy which means females date across or up financially, status-wise, age-wise, height and strength-wise, while males are more likely to date down in terms of status, finances, age, physical strength and height. This means men are okay with mating with someone who is younger, poorer, shorter, weaker and less famous. Generally speaking, it shows that males and females mating strategies are opposite but complementary. Males look for things they themselves lack which is nurturing and soft feminine energy and beauty. Females on the other hand look for someone who is physically stronger, more experienced and better provider. The urge to find a provider is so strong that women who are rich still want someone richer. This study is consistent in many different countries. David Buss also looked at men. It appears men generally want the opposite of what women want. One of the biggest criteria by which men choose is youth. Research conducted by Grammer in 1992 in Germany shows that as men gain more money and status, they tend to find partners who are younger. Of course, not all men have the choice. Since among Homo sapiens, the females are the selectors, men have to build the nest and hope that females show up. This is why men strive to get rich and famous so females notice them. This is why men used to carry big swords and rode big horses back in the days and today they buy sports cars which is peacocking to attract women. But historically, a small minority of men had all the women because they had all the resources and power. So generally speaking, most high status men have a younger partner which, while men of lower status are more likely to mate with women who are older than themselves. Of course, culture and religion also have an important influence in how we mate select. So morality has curbed some of our animalistic urges. The second most important criteria for men is beauty. According to evolutionary biology, beauty is generally understood to be tied to healthy genes. Since we have no knowledge of someone's genetic makeup, beauty is the best cue to judge if somebody is healthy who can produce healthy children. As women have become more financially independent in recent decades, they also prioritize look and choosing a mate. A third criteria by which men mate select is chastity. In most animals, their sexual organs are on the outside and visible for males to see when the females are ovulating. In humans, however, it's concealed, so human males do not know when a woman is fertile. As a result, humans can have sex anytime, so this opens up the possibility of paternity issues. When a man and woman mate, the female knows the child is theirs. But historically, it was impossible for a man to prove the child was theirs, so men had to rely on the woman's words or the physical features of the child. But we know humans lie, so one of the safest strategies for men was to mate a virgin. As a result, chastity has been important for men. Throughout the world, virginity was considered the ultimate sign of chastity. Today, thanks to DNA technology, paternity tests exist to determine the father of a child. Of course, these mating strategies are not always successful, so neither male nor female find the part. So, if neither male nor female find the partner they want, they choose the one that is available too. 
reality is a lot harsher than an ideal partner. So most of us, we end up with the person we are able to get. Mating practices. David Buss also found some other differences among the sexes. Men are far more prone to casual sex than women are. Again, biology dictates their behavior as women have to deal with the consequences. For men, there are no negative biological consequences when they have sex. Of course, the risk of STDs is one, but for women, the risks are far greater, including physiological, emotional, and sexually transmitted diseases. Another reason is the size of men's testes. Men produce sperms on a daily basis, while women tend to have one egg during their monthly cycle. Research carried out by David Schmidt in 52 different countries found that men have far greater sex drive than women. This is also because men take no biological risk in mating with a variety of women. Also, men produce sperm every day, which means they are ready all the time. So to sum up, according to David Buss, women look for security values such as the ability to provide, protect, while men value beauty and physical health, the ability to have good-looking and healthy children. As a result, men strive to gain social status and money, while women try to present themselves as beautiful and youthful possible. Men compete for financial resources, while women compete with makeup and plastic surgery. Men show off their fast cars with big butts, and women show off their big boobs, and so on. We are animals, after all. One of the biggest differences that has emerged in recent decades is the education system. Girls are outperforming in schools and universities. Once a male domain has become a female domain. Why? Eleanor McCoby, born in 1917, died in 2018, was an American psychologist who wanted to find out psychological differences among men and women. The orthodox psychology tended to mainly focus on the similarities between men and women. She looked at 1600 studies and published her findings in 1974 in a book titled The Psychology of Sex Differences. Despite the fact that many of these differences turned out to be superficial, one major difference showed up in all the studies consistently. It was that girls do better in schools and boys do worse. This was particularly puzzling as the conventional wisdom was that boys tend to prioritize achievement more than girls do. The common explanation given is that schools are based on instruction in which listening skills play a major role. This favors girls more than boys because studies show that females are more agreeable. This also translates into aggression as most people in prison are men. So schools are geared for girls simply because they listen better. But there's another explanation that male and female brains are wired differently. How do you know this? The study of autism is an interesting one as it clearly shows that more often in boys than girls. Simon Baron Cohen, born in 1958, a British psychologist argues that the female brain is predominantly hardwired for empathy and male brain is hardwired for understanding systems. The old saying that women prioritize feelings while men prioritize logic and reasoning. His 2003 research looked at autism, a condition in which children find it difficult to connect with others socially and emotionally. But what's surprising about autism is that it's predominantly a male condition, so most of autistic children are boys. During his research, he found that females showed more sympathy and greater sensitivity towards facial expressions and nonverbal cues. The male brain, however, is more geared towards how systems work. Although women fall to the extremes of empathetic brains and men fall to the extremes of systematic brains, there is also an overlap. About 17% of males have an empathizing brain and 17% of females have a systematizing brain. For Baron Cohen, autism is an extreme form of the male brain, which lacks the ability to read other people's emotions. Autistic children tend to have an obsession with some kinds of systems like mathematical numbers, systems, games, computers, etc. Why? Because these are problem solution based. When you do maths, it's mostly problems that need an answer. The same is true about games and computers. So Baron Cohen argues that autism is simply the extreme of male brain. 
and some male brain is wired for things and female brain is wired for people. Jordan Peterson, born in 1959, the Canadian psychologist also argues that female brain is wired to understand and empathize with children. As the primary caregiver of children throughout history, women are hardwired to be more socially aware and read subtle emotional differences. It makes sense as they have been the primary nurturers for children for millions of years of human evolution. Men on the other hand are evolved as problem solvers, therefore their brain is wired to seek solutions. But since males and females have coexisted for millions of years, it makes sense that they also have more in common than differences. The bell curve shows men and women are more similar than different. But it's the differences and the extremes that exhibit a clear gender differences. Men are far more aggressive, therefore the majority of prisons are filled with men. But this aggression also helps men to rise up the career ladder as they are more risk tolerant, so most of the CEOs are also men. Men are biologically hardwired to compete. As a result of male competition, throughout history, the majority of men never procreated. For example, 8,000 years ago, for every one man, 17 women procreated. This means that only a minority of men were successful in mating with the majority of women. This male competition is also on a biological level. A woman generally produces one egg per month to be fertilized. But on the male side, the competition is fierce among millions of sperm chasing one egg. So males are evolutionary programmed to compete, which inherently makes them more aggressive and risk takers. And socially, it's males who pursue females and rarely the other way around. Throughout history, the majority of men died in wars. This mimics the sperm competition, where millions of sperms compete for one egg, but only one succeeds. Again, evolution favors that most men don't produce. Morality too reflects that. Protection of women is far more important than protection of men. The media shows that there's far more moral outrage at the death of a woman than a man. Next time you watch the news, pay attention. In times of disasters too, women are evacuated first. Our morality reflects our biological evolution. Hypothetically speaking, a single man can have thousands or even millions of babies, but a single woman is limited to a handful of children. So from an evolutionary perspective, who is more valuable? The old saying that a society with one man and hundred women can prosper, while a society with hundred men and one woman will die. So evolution says females are far more precious and important. This is why throughout history, men died in battles and rarely women were sent to wars. Even today, most dangerous jobs were taken by men. Hence, 90% of work-related deaths occur among men. Today, the human psyche has changed though. More and more women have taken the male role of working and providing in the developed world. Therefore, more women have chosen not to reproduce at all. Birth rates is at its lowest in most affluent countries simply because women work long hours, therefore no longer want to have babies. In poorer countries, however, the old gender roles means birth rate is still much higher than rich countries. Now this shift in rich countries has slowly shifted morality too. When in the future a spaceship sinks in space like the Titanic sank in the Atlantic Ocean, you will not hear ladies first on the lifeboat. You might hear Mr. Musk and Mr. Bezos first, and Mr. Bronson last. One of the key factors in sexual psychology has been the narrative of feminism that men and women are the same. As a result, many scholars are hesitant to contact research in the field that might show otherwise. Judah Peterson has come under a lot of attack from feminists for saying that men and women are different. I think the argument from a feminist side has been that by proving a sexual difference between men and women, it perpetuates the old stereotype that only men can do certain things and vice versa. However, given our biological differences, it takes a decade and centuries to equalize the differences. But can we really fight evolution? It's a very touchy topic these days due to another development in rich countries, transgenderism. So the psychology of the sexes has become an ideological battleground. Therefore, it makes it hard to have an open and honest conversation. 
on the left they minimize the differences while on the right they maximize the differences between men and women but there's no doubt that most societies are changing when it comes to gender roles perhaps there's another evolutionary process today a vast number of men lack the ability to mate which is similar to most of history only a minority of men have access to the majority of women we are animals and we are evolving so to sum up, the psychology of the sexes showed that our biological differences translate themselves into our psychological differences. The difference is more visible in our mating strategies. Males and females seek the opposites for themselves. This makes sense. Millions of years of evolution has created opposite sex that each sex desire. It's not rocket science. Females value strong masculine protectors, while males seek kind, nurturing mates. But human civilization has tamed the world, so while our psychology is stuck in the past, our physical and social world is very different and very safe. Therefore, a vast number of men feel no longer needed as protectors and providers, because the police and military protect everyone and women earn their own money. As a result, more and more people live alone as marriage and childbirth rates have decreased. As science becomes more powerful, perhaps in some distant future, there is no need for mating at all as we can procreate babies in labs, like Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. But until then, we have to chase each other. In the next segment, I'll discuss the problem of psychology itself, mainly the psychological paradox of personality, as well as the problems of psychiatry. Eleven, psychological paradox. While psychology has revolutionized our understanding of the human mind, it has also come under criticism. Fundamentally, the biggest paradox of psychology is similar to Zeno's paradox. As soon as you measure today's psyche, we humans react and change. So no matter how up-to-date psychology is, it can never catch up with the latest human psyche. It can never fully understand the human psyche through the human psyche. In other words, we are the tool of observation as well as the subject of observation. It is akin to quantum physics, the mere observation changes the subject. If unobserved, the subject behaves one way, and as soon as it's under observation, it behaves differently. Unaware, we have one persona, and as soon as we know someone is watching us, we change our persona. According to Gordon Allport, born in 1897 and died in 1967, an American psychologist, psychology is too stuck in the past and pays little attention to the future. Quote, people are busy leading their lives into the future, whereas psychology for the most part is busy tracing them into the past. Psychology from early on had two distinct approaches. Behaviorism focused on how we learn to behave in the way we do, and psychoanalysis focused on how the unconscious gives us our personality. In other words, behaviorism bundled everyone as behavior animals without any unique personality, while psychoanalysis explained through just acquired personality through the past memory baggage. What was missing was the current personality and motivations. So Alport wanted to study the present, not the past, taking an empirical and scientific approach. After some research, he settled on one specific topic, language. He gathered all the English words describing someone's traits. He found 18,000 words and then narrowed it to 4,500 words that could be objectively studied. He came up with three traits, cardinal, common, and secondary. Cardinal traits are fundamental to a person that continues throughout their lives. For instance, explorers, hikers, poets, artists are driven by a powerful force that motivates them to push on. Common traits on the other hand are general characteristics like someone is honest or aggressive. While cardinal traits tend to be rooted deeper in biology, common traits are taught by others or nurtured in society. Secondary traits like preferences are less important and often invisible to most people. How do we acquire such traits? Alport offers two forces that work in tandem. 
biological and environmental. The internal force he called genotype, like being creative and independent, which help us survive the elements. And the external force he called phenotype, like being kind, rude, afraid, irritable, etc. that help us navigate society. He famously studied the story of Robinson Crusoe, who needed his genotype traits to survive on the island and phenotype traits once he met other characters. So, Allport criticized psychology for being too stuck in the past, while the individual was heading towards the future. This is like Zeno's paradox. By the time a psychologist understands an individual's psyche, he or she has moved on. So the study of the human psyche is a catch-up process that is never fully up to date. We are forward-looking creatures, therefore our personality traits, partly innate, partly acquired, determine our current motivations and future lives. Intelligence Apart from personality differences, intelligence is another area that differs among individuals. Alfred Bennett, born in 1857, died in 1911, was a French psychologist who, while conducting research on human intelligence and learning, learned that intelligence is not fixed as it was stated by scientists such as Francis Galton, Charles Darwin's cousin, or William Wundt, the German psychologist who also proposed intelligence quotient, or IQ. Bennett argued that intelligence is somewhat fixed at birth, but it has the potential to grow as a child develops. Just as personality is constantly changing, our intelligence too is very dynamic. Together with another French psychologist, Theodore Simon, he developed a scale called Bennett-Simon scale, which is used in IQ tests and the basis of intelligence tests today. Just as personality psychologists were playing catch-up with changes, intelligence tests too have been playing catch-up as we go through changes. But these modified intelligence tests suffer from the same problem as the IQ test. J.P. Guilford, born in 1897, died in 1987, had a problem with both the standard IQ test and Simon Bennett scale. The IQ test, he argued, failed to measure creativity, which by definition means there are more than one answer. The core problem of IQ test is what he called convergent answers. Basically, all roads lead to Rome, one place, which lacks values such as originality, fluency, flexibility, and elaboration. For Guilford, intelligence is made of three components, operation, content, and product. In other words, applied effort on a good project or idea leads to a new idea or product. The standard IQ test neglects the creativity side of our intelligence. If evolution wasn't creative, birds would be walking on the ground. Quote, the person who is capable of producing a large number of ideas per unit of time has a greater chance of having significant ideas. This idea that intelligence is not something solid but very dynamic and fluid is also echoed by the English psychologist Raymond Cattell, born in 1905, died in 1998, who argued that there are two types of intelligence, fluid and crystallized. Fluid intelligence allows us to reason and find connections without prior experience or knowledge. Crystallized intelligence, on the other hand, is from past experiences and knowledge learned. Fluid intelligence is a little like innate knowledge, proposed by rationalist philosophers such as Kant and Descartes. Crystallized intelligence is more like what empiricist philosophers such as John Locke and David Hume would term as learned experiences. Personality meets intelligence. As we saw that there are personality types among individuals, the same is true about intelligence level. Some extremely intelligent individuals, whom we call geniuses, have a personality trait very similar to the temperaments of psychotics. Hans J. Eysenck, born in 1916, died in 1997, a German-born British biologist and psychologist wanted to find out whether genius and madness had anything in common. Throughout history, great geniuses had bouts of insanity, and a great example is Vincent van Gogh, the Dutch master and his friend Paul Gauguin. 
I think particularly wanted to study temperament. As I discussed before, the Greek physician Galen classified people into four temperamental types sanguine or cheerful, choleric or hot tempered, phlegmatic or lazy, and melancholic or pessimistic. I think himself, a biologist, believed we are biologically wired to have certain temperaments, so he tried to put Galen's theory to the test. But he modified it a bit by making a model that had neuroticism or emotional turmoil on one end of the spectrum and emotional calm stoicism on the other end. He also added another dimension, extroversion or outgoing temperament and introversion or shy temperament. He carried out his tests on a large number of people, but it was his study of mental asylum patients that prompted him to add another dimension which he called psychoticism or simply insanity temperament. In other words, I think put insanity on a spectrum, not the usual sanity as normal and insanity as abnormal. His studies showed that those suffering from psychotic conditions had a lot in common with geniuses as they both showed greater over-inclusive thinking ability. For example, during the study, the subjects were told certain words like hand and then asked the subjects to associate other words with the word hand. For example, finger, glove, clap, etc. Those with a narrow range of answers could only associate one or two, but those with a wide or inclusive set of answers could offer far more associated words. The results showed that psychotics and geniuses showed greater aptitude towards originality and creativity. In other words, genius artists tend to have psychotic temperaments, the over-inclusive thinking ability, but this doesn't mean there's a causal link between the two. Quote, psychoticism in the absence of psychosis is the vital element in translating the trait of creativity, originality, from potential to actual achievement. So to sum up, Iseng's research showed that geniuses and psychiatric patients shared a common thinking style and psychotic temperament seems essential in creativity and originality. While Iseng explained personality traits through biological factors, he failed to take environmental factors into consideration. Walter Mischel, born in 1930, died in 2018, an Austrian-born American psychologist saw personality types to be too confusing and too widely inaccurate. In 1968, he published the famous book Personality and Assessment, in which he argued that it was absurd to believe that personality had nothing to do with the environment. If you put the same person in two widely different settings, he would show different personality types. He later devised a study in which he gave children a marshmallow and told them they either eat one marshmallow or wait 20 minutes and have two. He followed those kids as they grew up and found that those who waited did better in life. Today we know the term delayed gratification versus instant gratification which shows if a person is successful or not. So to sum up, orthodox personality psychology mainly focused on how personality impacts behavior. Michel's research, however, put personality psychology on its head, arguing that it's behavior that reveals personality, not the other way around. In other words, because of the psychological paradox, today's personality cannot predict future behaviors. The human psyche is highly reactive, therefore the most accurate way to study is through behavior. This makes psychology something akin to archaeology, which means it can only draw conclusion retrospectively, not prospectively. In other words, psychologists are always looking back and never fully accurate looking ahead. Anti-psychiatry In recent decades, psychology in general and psychiatry in particular have come under attack for inventing illnesses. One of the main reasons is how many new diseases have been added to the list over the past few years and decades. Psychiatry critics point that the difference between developing and developed world and how many different disorders are officially accepted in the developed world compared to the developing world. Another criticism has been the prescription of medicine. Nowadays, millions of people are on medication from which they find it difficult to come off. 
This anti-psychiatry sentiment is not new. Some of the criticism have come from other psychologists. David Rosenham, born in 1929, died in 2012. An American psychologist wanted to find out if psychiatrists were good at judging sane people from insane. In 1973, he did a study in which he sent healthy men and women of various ages and jobs to various mental hospitals. They all pretended to be mentally ill, so they were admitted to hospitals. When describing their illness, they would use vague terms like hearing noises. After they were admitted to the hospital, they acted and behaved normally without showing any signs or symptoms of any mental illness. On average, they all stayed in a mental hospital for nearly 20 days, where they felt they were losing their sense of autonomy and power to be themselves. They kept a journal of their experience. At first, they did it secretly, but later openly, which was seen by the hospital staff as somewhat odd behavior. The staff didn't detect that they were fake. However, some of the other patients noticed that they might be fake. Rosenham repeated the experiment later, but this time he told the staff that among the new patients, there might be one imposter, someone who pretends to be mentally ill. The staff were asked to rate the new patients to find the fake one. Out of 193 real patients, 41 genuine patients were suspected as fake and 23 patients with real mental illnesses were flagged as fake by at least one psychiatrist. So Rosenham showed that psychiatrists are just people who suffer from the same flaws their patients suffer, the inability to be the best judge of other people. As a result, psychology and psychiatry in particular has come under attack. In 1961, the Hungarian-American psychiatrist Thomas Saas published the book titled The Myth of Mental Illness, in which he argued that mental illness is a way of labeling someone. He argued that a lot of what is termed as mental illnesses is simply life being too tough at times. So both Rosenham's study and Thomas Saas showed that mental illness is not as clear-cut abnormality as psychiatry makes them. So to sum up, psychology has a very tricky job of diagnosing the human mind while using the human mind. This creates a paradox in which the observer is also the observed. Since we can neither fully disconnect consciousness from the subject nor from the observer, it's always an approximate science. The other paradox is of course the paradox of change. Zeno's paradox deals with measuring space and time. Psychological paradox is similar in that as soon as you understand the human personality, it has changed or moved on. Therefore, psychology is a catch-up endeavor without the ability to fully catch up. Another biggest paradox of psychiatry is the more we know, the more disorders are diagnosed. In other words, the more psychological parameters shift, the more illnesses it finds. Conclusion To sum up this course, in part 1 I discussed the philosophical origin of psychology. For example, the Greek psychology of humorism was akin to modern science of physiology. In ancient India, the study of consciousness was tied to religious experience. The more conscious one is, the more enlightened he or she is. Then in the Islamic world, dualism of mind versus body influenced Renaissance Europe. With the invention of modern sciences in Europe, philosophy gave birth to physics to study physical world, biology to study life, and finally psychology to study the human mind. With the invention of psychology, the study of consciousness became a scientific endeavor. Then I looked at different branches of psychology and a brief history of its development. In German-speaking world, psychology took an analytical approach which gave birth to psychoanalysis that divided consciousness into two parts, conscious and unconscious. However, in Russia, behaviorism focused on the empirical study of behavior as the best predictor of the psyche. While both psychoanalysis and behavior psychology were more deterministic, in the US, cognitive psychology focused on empowering the individual. In part 2, I looked at how psychology explains the human psyche. On the one hand, structuralism sees consciousness as a structure that can be broken down into smaller parts and each analyzed separately. 
However, functionalism, influenced by the evolutionary biology of Charles Darwin, sees consciousness as a whole, much more like a stream rather than solid structure. Behavior psychology, however, saw consciousness as too subjective, so they opted to observe behavior, which can be studied objectively. So behaviorism took the cue that action speaks louder than words. But psychoanalysis thought behavior doesn't tell you the full picture. So they returned to consciousness itself to discover a whole hidden unconscious world that determines a lot of our behavior. So according to psychoanalysis, our consciousness is just the tip of the iceberg. I discussed how Freud focused on the individual unconscious while Jung focused on the collective unconscious. In part 3, I looked at how psychology cured modern suffering. Psychotherapy took its cue from psychoanalysis focused on the individual patients. Gestalt psychotherapy took a masculine approach of tough love, therefore emphasized responsibility, while humanistic psychotherapy took a more softer approach to fulfillment and existential psychotherapy focused on meaning and purpose in life. Cognitive psychology and cognitive psychotherapy shifted the focus on our cognitive abilities. So perception, attention, memory and intelligence became the main focus of psychological studies. Since both behavior and psychoanalysis blamed environmental conditioning and the unconscious, cognitive psychology tried to empower the individual through perception. In other words, how you see the world can have a massive influence on how you see yourself. In part 4, I looked at other factors such as society, age, gender, and personality. In social psychology, we saw how individuals are pulled to conform through group pressure or obedience, but also pushed by original creative thinking. Social change results when individuals push boundaries. In child psychology, I discussed how some of the psyche is age-specific. For example, our ability to learn language veins as we age. Same is true about attachment. As we grow up, we feel less and less attached to others. In sex psychology, I discuss some of the major differences between males and females when it comes to mating habits and strategies. Males and females have evolved to complement each other in order to make the process of procreation easier. And finally, I also talked about the psychological paradox that the observer is also the observed and psychology of personality that as soon as you observe personality, it changes. But despite its limitations, psychology has immensely helped us understand the human mind on a deeper level. But the mystery of consciousness is still unresolved. If you have made it to this point, well done. So my question to you, which branch of psychology resonated with you the most? Or more interesting question is, where do you see psychology heading? Do you think we can understand consciousness soon? As always, I appreciate you accompanying me on this long journey. Thank you.